Hello, it's seven o'clock. This is Sky News Breakfast. These are our top stories this morning. Criminals must have no place to hide. The Home Secretary's plans to change the way police deal with so-called low-level crimes. The Spanish FA will hold an urgent meeting over the World Cup kiss row with the Federation's president under increasing pressure to resign. Police launch an investigation as two people die after becoming trapped in their car in a flooded road in Liverpool. The future of dementia care and the smart sock technology which could help those living with the disease. In the sport, Victor Hovland is waking up £14 million richer today after becoming FedEx Cup champion. We'll tell you how he did it later. And at a quarter to eight, we'll have a run through of the morning's papers. Hello, good morning. Welcome to Sky News Breakfast. Thanks for joining us. The Home Secretary has told police forces in England and Wales that they must pursue all reasonable lines of inquiry when trying to solve crimes such as shoplifting and theft. Forces have been told to use CCTV, doorbell footage and dash cams to help catch offenders and increase conviction rates for so-called low-level offences. Well, let's talk to our political correspondent, Amanda Aikas, who has more on this. And, and Amanda, uh, the kind of stuff that the Home Secretary is suggesting police forces do is something that a lot of people will say, well, hang on, why aren't they doing this already? Well, yes, indeed. And we haven't really heard all that much from the Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, this summer. But this week, we've having a whole series of announcements on crime, including this pledge that the police will have to investigate every theft um, and that even uh, when a car or a bike or phone is stolen, um, that ignoring those kind of lower level crimes is completely unacceptable. Now, figures um, show that from the year to March, just 4.4% of thefts led to someone being charged, the figure even lower for something like burglary and vehicle theft just 1.8%. Now, clearly, this is an issue that voters get very angry about, and the Home Secretary this morning says she's heard too many stories um, of people who feel that... Um, the police haven't acted on helpful leads because they don't see this as important enough, which is damaging overall confidence in policing itself. And, of course, we've had this proliferation in, in technology at home, GPS, video doorbells, CCTV, um, giving police more potential evidence. Now the uh, College of Policing have updated their guidance to ensure that officers do follow up such leads. Um, but, of course, as you say, this does really beg the question, why isn't this something that the police are doing already? Um, Labour have been exceedingly critical this morning. They say it's a staggering admission of 13 years of Tory failure on policing and crime, um, and it's because of the government's abysmal management um, of the issue over the past 13 years. They say that over 19% of crimes go unsolved. OK, Amanda, thanks very much for that. Well, let's get more on that about the government's plan uh, to house asylum seekers on the Bibby Stockholm barge as well, could potentially face a legal challenge. We'll talk about that uh, in a moment. Let's bring in the Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, who joins us now from our Westminster studio. Uh, very good to talk to you this morning. Thank you for joining us. So you're uh, talking today about police, police committing to pursue all reasonable lines of inquiry. Why on earth are they not doing that already? Good morning. Very pleased to join you. Well, since I've become Home Secretary about a year ago, I've been working on a huge programme of police reform to ensure that the police get back to basics, common sense policing, as I call it. It means removing unnecessary burdens from police time, like mental health call-outs or home office counting rules and needless bureaucracy. It means a record number of police officers. And now it also means taking every crime seriously, ensuring that no crime is treated as minor uh, and making sure that they follow up on every reasonable line of inquiry. This is a landmark commitment. It's an, uh, I've challenged the police to make this agreement. It's now over to them to actually deliver this on the ground on case-by-case -case instances so that victims of crime have greater confidence in the police, knowing that they will follow up on leads, that they will take theft, robbery, drug dealing, street-level drug crime more seriously. But there are no extra resources, there are no extra staff to do these jobs. The police are not sitting around on their hands, are they? They are, are all working at the moment. So what will go as a result of this? What will they not be investigating? 
Well, I disagree with you. There are no extra resources. We've just recruited 20,000 additional police officers. Well, so we well, now you, have you recruited 3,000 record... additional police officers. You, you lost 20,000 police officers, didn't you, over uh, from 2010 up to, up to the latest date. So you've lost 20,000, you've gained 23,000. So you've gained 3,000. That's wrong. We now have a record number of police officers. It's, it's ever, the Home Office figures that I have Ever, here. ever in the history of policing, far higher than any previous administration. So the police have a the greatest number of police officers they've ever had at their disposal. Okay. We've also got Home Office figures. Is that you've got 149,000 police officers at the moment. There were 146 in 2010. So absolutely, you have got 3,000 more officers. These are the Home Office figures. Yeah, we've got a record number of police officers ever in the history of policing. So that's the highest number of men and, week, men and women working on the front line to stop crime and support victims. But what this is about, it's about things like robbery, it's about phone theft, it's about watch theft, it's about um, muggings, it's about vehicle theft, it's about street level drug use and drug dealing. It's ensuring uh, and instilling confidence in the public that the police will follow up when they see leads and they have actionable evidence. So if, if a victim of crime comes forward and has some evidence that their car is being resold online, if a victim of crime has CCTV footage of a burglary being committed or a robbery taking place, if they can provide um, information from a Find My Phone uh, tracking app or GPS data, if there's a sight or smell of cannabis on the streets, those kinds of leads, those evidential leads will be sufficient now for the police to take action uh, and to follow those up. That's modelled on a successful and pioneering approach taken in Greater Manchester Police, where following every reasonable line of inquiry, work to increase the, to increase the charge rate, increase outcomes for victims and increase victim confidence. Uh, let's move on to, to, to asylum, of course, which is, is very much a large part of your brief. It's been reported today that the government is, is considering tagging asylum seekers arriving in the UK uh, to prevent those that you can't house in detention centres disappearing from the system. Is this true? Is this something you're looking at? We've just uh, enacted uh, a landmark piece of legislation in the form of our Illegal Migration Act. That empowers uh, us to detain those who arrive here illegally there and thereafter to swiftly remove them to a safe country like Rwanda. But will you put tags on them in the, in the, in the meantime? That will require uh, a power to detain and ultimately control those people. We need to exercise a level of control of people if we're to, to remove them from the United Kingdom. We are considering a range of options. We have several thousand uh, or a, few, a couple of thousand detention places in our existing removal capacity. Uh, we will be working intensively to increase that. But it's clear we're in, in exploring a range of options, all options, to ensure that we have that level of control over people so that they can flow through our system swiftly to enable us to thereafter remove them from the United Kingdom. So not, not ruling it out. I mean, the legal challenges to the Rwanda scheme are going on through the courts, not expected to be resolved until almost Christmas. You've got 2,000 spaces in the system. That's not enough, is it? What on earth are you going to do with all the others? Well, let's be clear. No one is suggesting that we need to build, you know, 40,000 new detention places. That's not what we are proposing. Uh, we will need to increase some of our detention capacity, but we already have, as I say, a few thousand uh, places in existence already. This is about flow. This is about ensuring that people who arrive are processed quickly through our system and they after are removed swiftly. So, we do have capacity existing right now. We're going to use that. But let's be clear, yes, we will have to wait until the outcome of our litigation in the Supreme Court relating to Rwanda. And if we are successful, we will be operationalising our policy. If we're thwarted by the courts, if we're stopped from doing so, we'll do whatever it takes to ensure that we can stop the boats. That's a pledge that the Prime Minister has made. That's one that I have made. It's one that we are working both night and day to deliver. It, it isn't working, though, is it? Last week alone, there were 1,773 migrants who crossed the channel. Uh, do you not think it was a mistake to make such a bold pledge at the start of the year? 
it's what the British people expect of us. It's what I passionately believe is the right thing working. to do. Uh, and we are making progress. As I said, we've passed our landmark legislation. But let's also be clear about what we're up against. We're up against a range of forces which are intent on stopping us, whether it's immigration lawyers, charities, NGOs, many of whom have very close links with the Labour Party, operating night and day to stop us in delivering this pledge through legal challenges in the courts, through administering uh, dodgy legal advice to illegal asylum claimants and illegal migrants, through sometimes facilitating illegal migration through their so-called charitable work. There's a range of forces that we are dealing with, including no less than the Labour Party, which is intent but, well, on Well, the Labour Party haven't been in power for 13 years, so it does seem a little rich to blame them for the, for the, for the crossing numbers. no plan whatsoever to stop the boats. They support you, free you, movement of people, and actually okay. they want to facilitate illegal migration. Well, let, well let's get, get back to what the Conservative government is doing. We, we're giving France half a billion pounds over, over three years to try to boost policing on, on the beaches there. I mean, is it good value for, for money uh, in terms of the number of intercepts that are carried out? It's actually fallen slightly this year compared to last Last year, hasn't it? I mean, is it worth the paper that it's written on? Our relationship with France is absolutely critical to succeeding in stopping the boats. I work very closely with my opposite number, the Interior Minister for France, and I know at the highest levels between Prime Minister and President, uh, we are collaborating and working closely. We now have, for the first time ever, UK Border Force officers working side by side with French Border Force officers in France to increase the surveillance, to increase the intelligence sharing. And there have been hundreds of arrests of people smuggling gangs and convictions of uh, those who are facilitating illegal migration across the channel. It's vital if... that we work upstream. But let's be also be clear, the only, really, uh, the only effective way to stop this problem is to break the model of the people smuggling gangs through upstream interception, but also by deterrence and ensuring that those who attempt this journey in the first place will be penalised and will have to face consequences such as removal from the United Kingdom. Before we go, uh, Nadine Dorries, of course, resigned at the weekend. What did you make of her resignation letter? Do you feel you're part of a, a zombie government? Well, I respect Nadine Dorries, but I disagree with much of her letter. I believe that we've uh, achieved a huge amount. I know Rishi Sunak is a man of action and he's made some uh, important pledges to the British people. He's intent on delivering them, as am I and every Conservative Member of Parliament. Will you run for leader if he's forced out at the general election? <laughs> I'm here to stop the boats. I'm here to support Rishi Sunak and I'll be campaigning energetically for Rishi Sunak to be re-elected as Prime Minister, uh, for the Conservatives to win the next general election. Uh, and I believe that we have a, a good chance of uh, winning that election if we uh, meet all of our pledges and in particular uh, if we succeed in stopping the boats. Home Secretary Suella Brodman, thank you very much. Now, two people have died after becoming trapped in a car which was driven into flood water in Liverpool. Our correspondent, Sadia Chowdhury, is here to tell us more. And, and Sadia, I mean, it's astonishing that this has happened. Tell, tell us what, what we know. Uh, well, Merseyside Police are investigating this. The details remain a bit sketchy, but what we do know is that two people have died, as you say, after their uh, vehicle entered flood water. They were taken to hospital, they've been formally identified and their families have been informed. Now, you can see from this, these pictures uh, uh, just how much water there was in the area. This is on Queen's Drive in Mossley Hill, which is just off the M62 motorway as you're driving into Liverpool. Police say they received a report of concern for the safety of two people, a man and a woman, inside a black Mercedes. They responded. This was around 9.20 in the evening on Saturday night, so it's a time which would have been fairly dark. Um, from a police statement, you can see that there were lots of people involved in a rescue operation. I'll read out to you what... Detective Chief Inspector Mike Dalton at Merseyside Police said, he said, Our thoughts go out to the family of the man and woman who sadly lost their lives in this tragic incident. Despite the best efforts of passing members of the public, our officers and Merseyside Fire and Rescue Services at the scene. We are currently at the early stages of an ongoing investigation on Queen's Drive to establish the circumstances of this tragic incident. Well, people are being asked to avoid the road uh, and police are appealing for any witnesses who may have been in the area at the time or any CCTV or dash cam footage. OK, Sadia, thank you very much. 
Now, the Spanish Football Federation will hold an urgent meeting today after its president was suspended by FIFA. Luis Rubiales had refused to step down despite calls for him to go after he kissed player Jenny Hermoso at the Women's World Cup final. An internal investigation is also taking place as the Federation activated its sexual violence protocol. Our correspondent Becky Cottrell has the latest. It will be interesting to see what happens today, particularly with any developments around that emergency meeting of Spain's Football Federation. The new interim president, Pedro uh, Rojas, will be acutely aware of the pressure around this story and he will want to be seen to get his next move right. The Spanish Football Federation, I think it's fair to say, didn't get things right after that kiss, after the backlash. They came out very much in defence of Luis Rubiales, even threatening Jenny Hermoso with legal action, of course, now Luis Rubiales has been uh, suspended by FIFA and although his presence will still loom large over Spanish football, I think those at the top now will want to take a different approach. There is pressure from the government saying that they do not want to see Luis Rubiales in a position of power in Spanish football ever again. You've got the players, uh, Spain's national women's squad, uh, those players saying that they will not return uh, until Luis Rubiales steps down. Then you've got many members of the public who are not happy about this and we expect there might be some kind of demonstrations today uh, in protest at how this has all been handled and I think therefore you might see kind of three things happening in the next 24 hours the next couple of days you could see Luis Rubiales just saying you know enough's enough okay I'm gonna go the pressure's got too much you could see the Spanish Football Federation uh, after they've had that meeting today kind of calling for Luis Rubiales to resign or sort of taking steps uh, to make that uh, a reality or they could simply say we support the suspension and the investigation that's taking place and we'll wait to see the outcome of that I think to be honest if the third one was what the Football Federation are to go with that will not be enough to kind of make the media attention around this the anger around this go away let's take a look at some of the other stories making the news this morning in Northumbria police have charged two men with the murder of Andy Foster following a suspected ammonia attack in Gateshead. Police believe the 26-year-old was sprayed with a chemical on his doorstep last weekend. He later died. Kenneth Fawcett and John Wanless will appear before magistrates at Newcastle Crown Court later today. Aston Villa's team bus has been attacked after their Premier League match against Burnley. The incident took place at Junction 10 on the M65 motorway following the game at Turf Moor yesterday afternoon. Lancashire police said a brick was thrown at the bus, which struck the windscreen and caused some damage to the vehicle. A small number of people have been injured after a P&O cruise liner was involved in a weather-related incident in Mallorca, the company says. It's reported that the P&O ship Britannia, carrying thousands of travellers, crashed into a freight vessel during severe storms. The future of dementia care could be changing as researchers begin a new study into smart sock technology to help people living with the disease. They monitor the user's temperature, heart rate and signs of distress that could stop injuries before they happen. Our West of England correspondent Dan Whitehead reports. Hello, Peter. At the Garden House Care Home in Bristol, 89-year-old resident Peter Drew is taking part in scientific research, specifically his new socks. The invention wirelessly transmits data to an app used by care home staff. The information monitors vital stats as well as agitation in those living with dementia. On this page we're seeing activity, so how much Peter's moving around with, uh, with the sock. We also record his heart rate. What we're doing with the smart socks is to detect signs of distress that the person might not be able to articulate due to a condition like dementia. Um, it's really important that we detect this early so that the carer can intervene and support that person. So we generate an alert then through our app. The carer can respond to that alert, support the person. For carers at this home, any new way to look after their residents is welcome. It could certainly prevent um, falls um, because it would provide the, the early warning system for staff to um, it, it give into intervention. Um, it, could, um, it could prevent distress between um, two sets of residents, as well as all the usual signs of infection, pain and other physical things. The Smart Socks invention has just secured new research funding, which is being led by the University of Exeter.
For us, it's all about accurately measuring agitation and distress in people with dementia. So that's a real challenge because um, as dementia gets more severe, communication gets more difficult. It's time to do the largest study of these socks in nursing homes. So we're scaling things up. Uh, we're going to be trialling the socks on 30 people uh, living with dementia in uh, three or four nursing homes in the southwest. Ultimately, things like smart socks are intended for use not just in care settings, but inside people's actual homes. They are part of a growing trend in high-tech solutions to help people suffering with complex conditions. We cannot have a carer, a professional carer, in each and every household of people living with dementia. Their partners are doing what they can, but they are limited with their capacity, and we need to support them. Technology is the way to support them, is the way to enable better care in the home. This is the latest invention to incorporate technology into the care system. There's a lot of anxiety there as well. Yeah. It allows nurses to have eyes and ears on a patient, even when they're not in the room. Dan Whitehead, Sky News, in Bristol. Now, the singer Florence Welsh has revealed that she's had life-saving emergency surgery after being forced to cancel gigs. The singer posted on Instagram on Sunday, adding, I don't really feel strong enough to tell you yet, but it saved my life. She's reassured fans she will be back to finish the Dance Fever tour in Lisbon and Malaga, perhaps with a little less jumping around. Also not jumping around. Uh, Alex, who's got the latest sports news. Well, I'm not jumping around, but football fans were yesterday because it was another enthralling day of action in the Premier League. Well, Team GB had a day to remember at the World Athletics Championship. So let's round up the sport for you now. VAR. VAR. Ooh, I just got deja vu. This sports bulletin is brought to you by Vitality Insurance. It was a special day for Team GB at the World Athletics Championship as they finished with a record equaling 10 medals, their best performance in 30 years. Keely Hodgkinson was one of the stars for Team GB, securing silver in the 800 metre final in Budapest. Keely Hodgkinson missed out on the gold medal in a dramatic finish to the race. The 21 year old had to settle for second place behind the winner, Kenya's Mary Mura. Hodgkinson also won silver at last year's World Championships and the Tokyo Olympics. Britain's other finalist, Gemma Riki, came home in fifth place. More medals followed on the final two track events. Britain's men's 4x400 metres relay team won a bronze. The USA won gold ahead of France. A bronze two for Britain in the women's 4x400 relay, matching their achievements from last year. The Netherlands just pipped Jamaica to the gold medal. Liverpool and Newcastle have played out some thrilling encounters over the years, and there was another classic instalment on Sunday. Darwin Nunez came off the bench to help Liverpool come from a goal down with 10 men to win 2-1 at St James's Park. Newcastle went in front in the first half after a mistake by Trent Alexander-Arnold allowed Anthony Gordon to score. And worse was to come for Liverpool three minutes later when captain Virgil van Dijk was sent off for a foul on Alexander Isak, denying the striker a goal-scoring opportunity. Despite being a player down, Liverpool kept Newcastle at bay and with nine minutes to go, substitute Darwin Nunez equalised. And in the third minute of stoppage time, Mohamed Salah set up Nunez to score the winner for Liverpool. And defending Premier League champions Manchester City made it three wins out of three after beating Sheffield United 2-1. Manchester City had to work hard for their win. Erling Haaland put them in front in the second half. That's after missing a first-half penalty. With five minutes to go, Sheffield United, who'd lost their first two games back in the Premier League, equalised with a goal from Jaden Bogle. But with two minutes to go, City secured the win with a goal from Rodri, the winner's manager Pep Guardiola's 200th in the Premier League. Aston Villa made it back-to-back -back wins in the Premier League after beating Burnley 3-1. Burnley are yet to pick up a point this season. Matty Cash scored twice in the first half to help Aston Villa on their way to victory. Cash hadn't scored in 15 months in the Premier League prior to yesterday's game. 
In the championship, Blackburn beat Watford 1-0 to get their first victory at Vicarage Road for 22 years. Brian Hedges scored the only goal of the game. In Germany, England captain Harry Kane scored twice for Bayern Munich on his home debut in a 3-1 win over Augsburg. Kane has now got three goals since joining the club from Tottenham. In golf, Norway's Victor Hovland will be waking up £14 million richer today after he won the Tour Championship and season-ending FedEx Cup in Atlanta. Hovland hit a bogey-free 7-under par 63 to win by five strokes on 27-under par, holding off the challenge of Xander Schofle. This was Hovland's sixth PGA Tour title, but the biggest win of his career. In cricket, Oval Invincibles have won the 100 competition for the first time after they beat the Manchester Originals in the final. Chasing 162 for the win, Manchester Originals finished on 147 as the men's Invincibles celebrated becoming champions by 14 runs. Southern Brave are the women's champions. They beat Northern Superchargers by 24 runs, chasing 140. The Superchargers were all out for 105. Grace Ballinger was the last wicket to fall. She was run out by a throw from Georgia Adams. A world champion, Max Verstappen, has equaled the record of consecutive Formula One race wins after his ninth straight victory at the Dutch Grand Prix. In a rain-interrupted race, Verstappen came home ahead of Fernando Alonso with Pierre Gasly in third. He now leads the world championship by 138 points. The win matches Sebastian Vettel's record set 10 years ago. And that's all your sport for now. We'll have another update in the next hour. Don't look at me. My owner always carries around a bag. Thanks, Alex. Let's get a look at the weather now. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. It will be dry for most today and a bit warmer, but showery outbreaks moving into the far northwest later will spread southeast on Tuesday. Uh, mainly fine now, but fog in places, little patchy rain over parts of eastern England and showers near northwestern coasts. This morning will be mostly fine with any fog soon lifting, but Lincolnshire, East Anglia and the southeast will see cloud and patchy light rain taking over. The odd light shower elsewhere, the afternoon will bring little change. The Weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Still to come on Sky News Breakfast, Russia has confirmed that Yevgeny Prigozhin was killed in yesterday's plane crash after using DNA evidence to identify his remains. Stay with us for more on that. What we're actually trying to do here is, is, is combine what has worked really, really well in, in professional sports, because that's where the, the technology is coming from, and combining that into industrial shipping. So these are rigid sails. They're up to 40 meters high, so that's really, really tall. It's the same product that you use in, in windmills, so it's that, that composite that we're actually using. But also these, these sails are actually detractable as well, so we can actually move them around, and that makes it unique, and we're trying to get the best of, uh, of both worlds in a way. What we've uh, chosen for in this, uh, in this pilot, because that's basically what it is, is to start with two. Uh, we think we can put that up to three. And with those three, you can get up to savings of 30% of fuel and 30% of carbon emissions. But the thing is, uh, supply chains as we know them today are very different as what they were in the days of, of wind, right? When we're just hoping our products to come in time. And, and what we're now doing is trying to combine wind with the normal propulsion, so the normal engine. So we're having the best of the two worlds again. One is the savings on the carbon, but also still have the reliability of these supply chains and, and just-in-time kind of deliveries, which is also very important to uh, reduce emissions. Innovation is, is never without risk, I, I would say, but we went through all the, the, the stages and, and safety, of course, is number one. Uh, that's why you get to class societies who really look at 
all these things that you're just talking about. Uh, but yeah, there's risk that we're not getting to the savings. There is risk that there is issues when the ship gets to port. Uh, but I'm sure that together we will innovate around those. And uh, I'm sure that the Windwings 2.0 is going to be even better than this one. We are basically at the moment counting on the same logistics and the same predictability as, as what we've seen before. Uh, we will see during the test and the trials if there's anything uh, different there. But the real concept behind this is that it's really the assisting part. So you're really going for the savings on the fuel and not really altering too much the uh, supply chain of the products that we're shipping. The five of us have made it out of the car. Welcome to Backstage, the film and TV podcast. You're watching Sky News Breakfast. The Home Secretary has called on police forces in England and Wales to follow all reasonable leads in a bid to drive down low-level crime. The Spanish Football Federation's called an urgent meeting today over the World Cup kiss as its president refuses calls to step down. And police have launched an investigation into the deaths of two people after they became trapped in a car which drove into floodwater in Merseyside. Half an hour ago, I spoke to the Home Secretary, Suella Bravman, and asked her about reports that the government is considering tagging asylum seekers arriving in the UK. She didn't rule it out. She said they're considering a range of options. We've just uh, enacted uh, a landmark piece of legislation in the form of our Legal Migration Act. That empowers uh, us to detain those who arrive here illegally there and thereafter to swiftly remove them to a safe country like but, Rwanda. But will you put tags on them in the, in the, in the meantime? That will require uh, a power to detain and ultimately control those people. We need to exercise a level of control of people if we're to, to remove them from the United Kingdom. We are considering a range of options. We have several thousand uh, or a couple of thousand detention places in our existing removal capacity. Uh, we will be working intensively to increase that. But it's clear we're in, in exploring a range of options, all options, to ensure that we have that level of control over people so that they can flow through our system swiftly to enable us to thereafter remove them from the United Kingdom. Well, our political correspondent Amanda Acas was listening to that interview and, and she joins me now. So, uh, certainly not ruling it out, Amanda. No, indeed. Now, really, this has been a summer of pretty terrible headlines for the government in terms of its policy on illegal migration. And we saw the Legionella bacteria discovered on the Bibby Stockholm barge, the number of people making the crossing in small boats just continuing to increase. It hit more than 19,000 last week. And up till now, we haven't really heard all that much from the woman in charge of all of this, the Home Secretary, Suella Bravman. And yes, as she said, before the summer recess, the government did successfully pass legislation, which gives her the power, indeed the legal duty, to detain migrants who arrive here illegally and then deport them either back home or to a safe um, legal uh, third country. Um, but in terms of the practical issues around that, they really haven't gone away. So on the one hand, we just don't have the capacity to detain the kinds of numbers that we're seeing coming in. Um, she refused to acknowledge that in a way, suggesting, well, we don't need to detain everyone. It's about the flow of people coming through. But I think the very fact that she didn't deny the fact that the Home Office are looking into electronically tagging um, these migrants demonstrates that they really are trying to look at different solutions given the delays in trying to secure alternative accommodation. Um, and of course, we're still waiting for the Rwanda deal um, to um, either get off the ground or to see what's going to happen with that, because at the moment it's stalled in the courts. Amanda, thanks very much. Russian authorities have confirmed that Yevgeny Prigozhin was killed in a plane crash on Wednesday. Investigators say they used DNA evidence to identify the remains of the Wagner leader. 
The Kremlin has denied any involvement in his death, but they're yet to confirm how the accident happened. Well, joining me now is Robert Clark. He's the director of the Defence and Security Unit at Civitas. Um, lovely to talk to you this morning. Um, in terms of this confirmation, I mean, uh, what do we know? I mean, we, we have to believe, I suppose, and face value what the Russian authorities are saying here, that this definitely was Prigozhin. Uh, good morning. No, exactly. Uh, there is very little uh, to go on at the minute. Um, what's um, uh, quite... Uh, we've got the British and the American intelligence agencies uh, have both uh, speculated that it is, in fact, uh, credible. The DNA evidence at the scene um, does, link the, does link the uh, body to Evgeny Prigozhin. Um, and to be perfectly honest, I think many of us are actually quite surprised it's taken this long for Vladimir Putin to exert revenge. Uh, we all knew uh, or widely suspected that Evgeny Prigozhin's days were numbered. Um, but to conduct the act of revenge, which we all suspected was coming in such a public uh, and live uh, format as the the the, uh, the plane uh, cr crashing down to the ground, um, I think just demonstrates once again Vladimir Putin's uh, barbarism um, and the fact that he is little more than uh, a gangster in office. Again, views that many of us have long held. Um, this was an incredibly public display of revenge. In terms of the impact it could have on Putin's leadership, I mean, obviously, as you say, it, it appears to be an act of revenge, and that's certainly nothing new for Vladimir Putin. But, but is he weakened or strengthened by this plane coming down? Oh, sure. There's many, there's many aspects of this which have both weakened uh, and, in fact, actually strengthened Putin's uh, sort of, uh, particularly his domestic uh, control within Russian politics. Um, there's a huge shift uh, underway at the minute in Russian, uh, in the Russian uh, elite, with how they see President Putin uh, becoming increasingly erratic uh, during this war against Ukraine. Um, the invasion itself uh, being a key demonstrator uh, of that. Um, in terms of his uh, his leadership, it does shore up somewhat his domestic image, uh, which obviously took such a uh, a public and brutal uh, uh, hit during Prigozhin's failed uh, push on Moscow two months ago. Um, but there's a lot more to this as well. Even at the tactical level in the war in Ukraine, um, the majority of Wagner's troops were used in quite brutal assaults, particularly if you recall around the town of Bakhmut. Well, now Russia are on the uh, defensive against the Ukrainian counteroffensive. Um, those troops weren't really going to be used much anyway. Um, so it's really kind of limited Wagner's impact uh, in the war at the moment. Uh, and like I say, potentially strengthened Putin's domestic image. We've heard uh, today that, um, that Ukrainian forces in the south seem to be pushing through some of, of the Russian front lines. Uh, it's, you know, in terms of, of progress that's being made on the ground, how would you characterise it at the moment? Well, it's actually going remarkably uh, well, to be perfectly honest. There's been a lot of negative uh, commentary um, over the last few months, particularly from European sources and supposed uh, leaks from uh, from America. But when we consider just how um, heavily defended the uh, Russian uh, defences have been, um, which they've they've been in place for nearly a year now, um, so the the going has been slow, but it's going very well. So at the moment, we've got the key uh, village or small town of Robotina, which is in the uh, Zaporizhia district. That's on the verge of falling. Um, and the reason why this is important is because that opens up the road to Tomak, which is a Russian logistics hub, and further south from there is the uh, the Azov Sea. That's crucial for Ukraine to sort of split the Russian land bridge, which links mainland Russia to Crimea, which is ultimately uh, one of the main deciding factors of this war, is who will have uh, control over Crimea. So the road to that suddenly becomes a lot more uh, visible, um, but there's still a lot. There's still a lot of heavy Russian defences further south. But the going is uh, uh, promising. But time is running increasingly against Ukraine. Um, the summer fighting season, if you like, is, is is almost coming to a close. It's been an incredibly wet summer already, uh, and we've got the Ukrainian sort of flash flood season approaching in September and October, rendering progress very very limiting. And, and just a final thought on the news over this. Uh collision between the, the two planes at the weekend, uh, obvious loss of, of, of a small number of, of very experienced pilots, but, but also this, this will come as a blow to morale for the Ukrainians as well, won't it? 
Oh, enormously. Um, the the pilots involved, including Andre Pilshikov, the the fabled uh, ghost um, from the, uh, the, the 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 battle over Ukrainian skies, particularly last last year over Kyiv, um, will come as an enormous blow to uh, the sort of Ukrainian population as a whole, um, who have, for understandable reasons, uh, sought to cling on to the the, the heroic uh, image of particular fighters, including these pilots. Um, and more than that, they're, they're a very rare, almost uh, battlefield commodity, if you like. This is incredibly, incredibly important when we consider the Ukrainians are going to take delivery of F-16 fighter jets. Uh, these pilots were undoubtedly um, in some form of training scheme for that uh, within the pipeline. So it is a huge hit to the Ukrainian Air Force, unfortunately. OK, Robert Clark, uh, Director of Defence and Security at Civitas. Thank you very much. Now, Japan had been hoping to join India in becoming one of the few countries to successfully complete a moon landing. But the proposed landing this morning was forced to be suspended because of strong winds. The unmanned mission was due to carry a lander capable of investigating the moon's surface. Joining me now is Chris Lintot. He's an astronomer and professor of astrophysics at Oxford University. Um, it, it's been called off today, but do we know when it may go ahead? We don't have an exact date, but the launch window lasts for another few weeks. So we're watching uh, for the rocket to launch from a site in Japan. Um, and then this little uh, mission will take probably four to six months to get to the moon. It's taking the lazy way and allowing the moon's gravity to just grab hold of it, essentially. There's the, the rocket uh, seen uh, this morning. Um, and, and so... You know, it's always a good day if the rocket's still in one piece. So it was just weather that got in the way today and we'll hope for a, a launch in the next couple of days. Mm. And, of course, we saw India successfully land last week, Russia failing to land the week before, and, and now Japan. Why now? Why are all of these countries competing to get onto the moon at the moment? I think that there's a few things going on. One is that there's tremendous excitement about the possibility for really a large-scale lunar exploration program in the next few decades. So we know that there are resources there. We found water uh, caught up in the regolith, the lunar soil near the South Pole, uh, which people think could be used for you know, drinking, but also for rocket fuel. So maybe this is a, a staging post for exploring the solar system. Um, technology has improved. The point of this slim mission, the, the Japanese mission that we're waiting to see launch, um, is to test um, automatic landing capabilities where the spacecraft guides itself down uh, and lands more accurately than would otherwise be possible. Uh, and, and new technology is making launch and satellite building cheaper. Um, but there's also a space race going on. Um, China has very ambitious plans to go to the moon uh, NASA, in partnership with countries around the world, including the European Space Agency, has uh, quite grandiose plans, um, plus some smaller missions uh, built by private companies, which should launch in the next year. Uh, and so you're seeing countries like India, uh, the UAE, that don't traditionally have large uh, space programs, seeing this as a, a source of national pride and wanting to be part of, of this exploration. Mm. Uh, and there's also the, this X-ray telescope, Exrism, I think it's pronounced. Um, why, why is that so important? Oh, well, this was the other thing on the rocket. And for people in my business looking at the distant universe, this is, is really exciting. We've been waiting a while for this. So um, with X-ray uh, detectors, which you have to fly in space, you can't see X-rays from space from here on the ground, we see the most energetic events in the universe, colliding black holes, uh, uh, merging neutron stars, all sorts of spectacular things. But we've actually got a gap in our capability. There's an ageing NASA satellite called Chandra that's done us well for most of two decades now, um, but that's becoming less sensitive. It may not last much longer. And so we need this telescope in orbit. So that's on top of the rocket. Um, so that will go into Earth orbit uh, and hopefully start to look at, at how the universe is evolving. Um, and then this little probe heads off to the moon, uh, sort of hitching a ride alongside. Well, fingers crossed you get to see it going up there soon. Chris Lintot, uh, good to talk to you. Thanks a lot. Right, let's get a look at the bank holiday weather. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. It's going to be dry for most today and a bit warmer, but showery outbreaks are moving into the far northwest later and will spread southeastwards on Tuesday. 
Mainly fine now, but fog in places, a little patchy rain over parts of eastern England and showers near northwestern coasts. The morning will be mostly fine, with any fog soon lifting, but Lincolnshire, East Anglia and the southeast will see cloud and patchy light rain taking over. There'll be the odd light shower elsewhere. The afternoon will bring little change, but eastern England will see cloud and any drizzle slowly clearing. The Weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. You're watching Sky News Breakfast. Coming up, we're going to bring you the morning papers with broadcaster and writer Edward Adu and the PR and crisis management expert Kevin Craig. Play Sky News. From the Sky News Centre at 7. Now that you're up to date, we can go into a bit more detail. Things can change incredibly quickly. Taken by surprise. Have you ever known a moment like this in British politics before? Yes. <laughs> Cheers. We'll start with breaking news. Let's get the latest on the ground. So, by the end, we'll hopefully all understand what's going on in the world just that little better. In Zaman Rashid and I'm Sky's North of England correspondent telling stories from this culturally rich region I call home. What kind of pollen gets up your nose? <laughs> Sky News Pollen Reports. Brought to you by the Kleenex Your Pollen Pal app. Well, the morning's pollen report, it's going to be mostly fine once any early fog lifts, but Lincolnshire, East Anglia and the South East will see cloud and patchy light rain or drizzle taking over. There'll be just the odd light shower elsewhere. It'll be a degree or so warmer than it has been recently. The afternoon will bring little change, but eastern England will slowly dry up, while showers elsewhere will begin to fade. Looking at pollen, counts will be mostly high in the warmer, mainly dry south, and low for much of the north. Sky News Pollen Reports, brought to you by the Kleenex Your Pollen Pal app. Time now to take a look through the morning papers. And joining me this morning, the broadcaster and writer Edward Adu, and also here in the studio, PR and crisis management expert Kevin Craig. Uh, nice to see you both again. Um, Kevin, let's just start with you th this hour. Um, 
illegal migrants to be uh, electronically tagged. This was something that we put to the Home Secretary uh, this hour, and she certainly didn't deny it, did she? She said the government's looking at all the options here. Yeah, and this um, story in The Telegraph on page four, it, um, it might surprise you. I don't, I don't think that it will cause the government uh, too many issues because uh, immigration and illegal immigration is, is a top five issue for the public. They want to be seen to be trying to sort out the mess that they've overseen in the last few years. And we, we have in this piece some comments where um, they are accused by a representative of a refugee organisation of treating people inhumanely. But I think they're, they're, they're trying to be seen to do something about the fact that often folks go missing. Um, and, you know, I mean, overall, the whole illegal migrant situation, they, they are perceived not to have a grip on. And this piece here, no wonder she hasn't denied it, because I think they'll, they'll look at that as an option. Mm. Edward, what do you think? I mean, Kevin says that it will play well with the public. Do you agree? I think it's, a, it's, it's an issue where it will, it will unfold and we keep on going. It's, it's certainly... Um, it's going, it's going to be, I would say, contentious when it comes to the election in terms of a, a pledge card to say, well, look, if we can tackle this, then in, in a sense, you know, we need your vote. Um, you, you've got to think of the numbers of the, the, the crossings. It's, in, it's increasing now to the point where people are going to be tagged. I mean, Enver uh, Solomon uh, from the, uh, I believe he's one of the refugee uh, charities, think for the Refugee Council, who says these are vulnerable people who... You know, some of which, uh, if you assess their backstory, I mean, people say, OK, look, they're, they're illegal immigrants, but they, they, they're they seeking refuge of, of some sort, Most some of them. Obviously, there's the issue connected to the trafficking as well. Um, whether this will work is another story. Because, I mean, in, in the piece, it says that if any abscond, um, if they don't um, respond to the text or if they don't go to the... Uh, to the office uh, in particular, where they need to report that they they will they, they won't be allowed to stay in, in in the UK. I mean, clearly it's about numbers. It's about trying to figure out a way to try and to keep the numbers down and and, and to ensure that the, the government are are on this. But it seems to be getting out of control. Okay, Edward. Uh, Kevin, the next uh, story you picked up in The Telegraph, now this is about Labour, that one of the things they're keen to talk about today, uh, is putting the family doctor back at the heart of, of patient care. Uh, what do they mean about that? So, so Jane, Labour, um, on page four of The Telegraph, you've got an opinion piece by Wes Streeting, which is supported by a front-page uh, story also, and Labour's talking about plans to allow GPs to be paid extra uh, when they offer patients a doctor of their choice. Uh, West Streeting, who I believe is very, very competent in this job, is talking about ending a like it or lump it um, situation for people with their health service. He, he wants to talk, give more control, more choice, so that um, patients, if they request a doctor of their choice locally and a GP service delivers on that, um, by reallocating resources, those GP practices will get paid more. There is definitely a sense that the NHS is at times to the user impersonal. Um, this story and Wes's piece also talks about two out of three patients never or rarely see a doctor of their choice and five million patients a month that didn't get an appointment when they tried. And there is a real sense that at that GP level it's not working as it should and he's, he's picking up on that. And he's got his own... Uh cancer story as well, Amazing hasn't he, which, is, which has given him well, and informed his, his, uh, his views. I was going to Edward? say as well, the, mm. concerning GP, it, my GP is great. I know some, so, so, some, some really... They've called at eight in the morning, they've told, they haven't got any, uh, they, they've got any, any spaces and they've got to call back during the day. And some of those um, issues were serious. I think that's the case of trying to move away from this uh, remote fashion and to try and see people face to face. If yeah. I know some surgeries are moving away from not calling eight o'clock in the morning and my, my GP practice are brilliant. You know, I can walk in there and they provide the best service, but I'm not sure whether it was not so much an excuse, but because of the way um, the procedural policy was enforced during the pandemic, during the first bit of lockdown and, and, and some surgeries just decided to follow suit and say, well, look, we just want to continue seeing patients remotely. 
Uh, Edward, an another story uh, in The Guardian, uh, which is uh, linked to health, I, I suppose. Uh, this is the ULES scheme. Uh, the Prime Minister's ULES stands puts decades of progress on clean air at risk, according to Sadiq Khan, uh, London Mayor. Of course, he's very keen to push this through, isn't he? Well, obviously, ULES, uh, the expansion, it's um, it's going to happen on, on Tuesday. It's probably the, the most contra controversial in terms of dividing London, because a lot of people have said, well, you know, why should we pay £12.50 to drive to our local shop or to uh, to go and see a relative? And this is about cleaner air in London. And, and this is personally connected to me because um, my niece, who I never got the opportunity to, to meet, sadly passed away, and that was uh, Ella Kissy Deborah. And she was the first person to have um, uh, what well, died from pollution on her on her um, death certificate. And her mum, Rosamond, uh, my cousin, she's been campaigning and and has been liaising with, with Sadiq Khan to ensure that there is cleaner air in London. I'm not sure, Jane or Kevin, whether you've walked along the Marlebone Road and if you've walked along the whole stretch of the Marlebone Road in London, I mean, clearly at some point you, you will cough. I mean, it's London. But concerning the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, I think uh, that the conversation or, or the piece uh, alludes to, to the fact that um, the Prime Minister may be sort of backing down on, on initiatives for cleaner air. And when Boris Johnson was the mayor of London, I think he, one of his uh, pledges, or certainly what he, he did with then the uh, Prime Minister um, um, David Cameron, was to set out objectives. And I think this whole issue with ULES even stretches back to when uh, Ken Livingston was was London mayor uh, to, to, to ensure that Londoners um, can, can breathe in, uh, have fresher air, and, and the capital can be greener. But it would be interesting. Also, I think there's connected to the story, this, this, uh, um, some, someone has found a loophole into ULES uh, regarding payment and, and challenged it and stated that on the actual boards, when they're driving into, into London or when they see a board, that it doesn't state, uh, state that you'll be liable for, um, for a penalty. And I think they, they've actually won this. So it'd be interesting to see uh, what happens with this when it's implemented and whether there will be other loopholes and, and whether Londoners will actually accept the fact and, and people driving into town that, look, this, this, may, have to, this may be the future in order to, to have to, or to breathe in, to have cleaner air in the capital. Can, can, I, can I just say one thing, Jane, as well, which is that basically politically, you know, it's, it's a real disappointment to me that ULES is being weaponised by uh, the Prime Minister to try and save his backside from further okay. electoral defeat. OK, we're going to have to leave that. We're nearly off air. Stay with Sky News Breakfast. Lots to come in the next hour. We'll give you more time to chant in the next hour of the papers. Stay with Sky.
Good morning. It's 8 o'clock. This is Sky News Breakfast. These are our top stories this morning. The Home Secretary tells Sky News she's considering a range of options as the government doesn't rule out the use of electronic tags on those who come to the UK on small boats. We need to exercise a level of control of people if we're to, to remove them from the United Kingdom. We are considering a range of options. The Spanish FA will hold an urgent meeting over the World Cup kiss row with the Federation's president under increasing pressure to resign. Police launch an investigation as two people die after becoming trapped in their car in a flooded road in Liverpool. The future of dementia care and the smart sock technology which could help those living with the disease. In sport, Victor Hovland is waking up £14 million richer today after becoming the FedEx Cup champion. We'll tell you how he did it later. And at a quarter to nine, we'll have a run-through of this morning's papers. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. The government is not ruling out using electronic tagging to control migrants who come to the UK illegally. Earlier, the Home Secretary told me she's considering a range of options in dealing with migrants who cross the channel in small boats. We've just uh, enacted uh, a landmark piece of legislation in the form of our Illegal Migration Act that empowers uh, us to detain those who arrive here illegally there and thereafter to swiftly remove them to a safe country like but, Rwanda. But will you put tags on them in the, in the, in the meantime? That will require uh, a power to detain and ultimately control those people. We need to exercise a level of control of people if we're to, to remove them from the United Kingdom. We are considering a range of options. We have several thousand uh, or a couple of thousand detention places in our existing removal capacity. Uh, we will be working intensively to increase that. But it's clear we're in, in exploring a range of options, all options, to ensure that we have that level of control over people so that they can flow through our system swiftly to enable us to thereafter remove them from the United Kingdom. We are making progress. As I said, we've passed our landmark legislation. But let's also be clear about what we're up against. We're up against a range of forces which are intent on stopping us, whether it's immigration lawyers, charities, NGOs, many of whom have very close links with the Labour Party, operating night and day to stop us in delivering this pledge through legal challenges in the courts, through administering uh, dodgy legal advice to to illegal asylum claimants and illegal migrants through sometimes facilitating illegal migration through their so-called charitable work. There's a range of forces that we are dealing with. Well, let's talk to our political correspondent, Amanda Akas, for, for more on this. Uh, so, Amanda, it does seem that the government certainly isn't ruling out the idea of tagging migrants. Yes, yeah, so this really is the first time we've heard from the Home Secretary after a summer of terrible headlines for the Home Office, what with Legionella on the Bibby Stockholm and the continuing rise in numbers of small boat crossings. And yes, as she repeatedly said there, before recess, the government did successfully manage to pass its illegal migration bill, giving her the legal duty to detain and then deport people who arrive here illegally. But the practical issues remain. Uh, the Rwanda deal is still stalled in the courts. She was quite bullish about this once they finally have a decision um, from the judges at the Court of Appeal on this. She said, we'll either operationalise it straight away if it's a positive decision, and if they reject it, well, she said, well, we'll do what it takes to make this happen. Um, Clearly, there are also issues around the scale of the detention facilities available. The Home Office reportedly looking into um, all kinds of other ideas to try and get round this, which is where this idea about electronic tagging has come from. And as you say, uh, the Home Secretary didn't deny that that was something that they are looking at, although that could also pose its own potential legal difficulties in future. Also, interestingly, she refused to comment on recent reports that despite the deal struck between the UK and France promising to pay nearly half a billion pounds to the French authorities to help uh, patrol the beaches in France over the next three years. The number of intercepts they've made so far this year has actually fallen slightly. Um, she wouldn't really comment on that. She just said the relationship between the UK and France is critical in trying to stop the small boats, stress the positive relationship between the Prime Minister and President Macron, perhaps in contrast to uh, the relationship between Mr Macron and Mr Sunak's predecessors. Amanda, thanks a lot.
Now, two people have died after becoming trapped in a car which was driven into flood water in Liverpool. Our correspondent Sadia Chowdhury is here to tell us more. What do we know, Sadia? Well, Merseyside Police have launched an investigation to try and figure out what happened. But what we do know is that two people died. They have been formally identified. Their families have been informed. And this occurred when they drove a vehicle into floodwaters in Liverpool. Now, we've got some pictures to show you just to see how much water there was there. This is on Queen's Drive in Mossley Hill, which is just off the M62 motorway as you're driving into Liverpool. Police say they received a report of concern for the safety of a man and a woman in a vehicle in a black Mercedes car. This happened around 9.20 in the evening on Saturday, so it's a time which would have been dark where visibility, even if you do know the area, would have been quite poor. Now, from a police statement, it appears that there were lots of people involved in uh, what was quite an extensive rescue operation. I'll read out to you what Merseyside Police Detective Chief Inspector Mike Dalton said. He said, our thoughts go out to the family of the man and woman who sadly lost their lives in this tragic incident. Despite the best efforts of passing members of the public, our officers and Merseyside Fire and Rescue Services at the scene, we are at the early stages of an ongoing investigation on Queen Dr Queen's Drive to establish the circumstances of this tragic incident. People are being uh, urged to avoid the area and police are still appealing for witnesses in the area or anyone that may have any CCTV or dash cam footage. OK, Sadia, thank you. Well, let's take a look at some of the other stories making the news this morning. The Northumbria Police have charged two men with the murder of man Andy Foster, who uh, was suspected, uh, who was a victim of a suspected ammonia attack in Gateshead. Police believe the 26-year-old was sprayed with a chemical on his doorstep last weekend and later died. Kenneth Fawcett and John Wanless will appear before magistrates at Newcastle Crown Court later today. Aston Villa's team bus has been attacked after their Premier League match against Burnley. The incident took place at Junction 10 on the M65 motorway following the game at Turf Moor yesterday afternoon. Lancashire police said a brick was thrown at the bus which struck the windscreen and caused some damage to the vehicle. A small number of people have been injured after a P&O cruise liner was involved in a weather-related incident in Mallorca, according to the company. It's reported the P&O ship Britannia, carrying thousands of travellers, crashed into a freight vessel during severe storms. Well, uh, let's get the uh, latest now from the Labour Party on this morning's political stories. Uh, joining me now is Shadow Minister for Employment, Justin Maddis. Good to talk to you uh, today. Uh, we spoke to the Home Secretary a short, short while ago. Uh, wonders what does the Labour Party think? Should we tag migrants? Well, the only people you tag are, are criminals. So um, my understanding is that people who come into this country seeking asylum are not criminals. They're usually people feel, fleeing persecution. And if there's a problem with uh, people absconding, this is the first I've heard about it. And clearly the solution to that is actually to get on and process the asylum applications a lot quicker than is happening. I think this is just another gimmick that is not dealing with the root of the problem at all. The Home Secretary is partly blaming the Labour Party for the, for the problems with migration. She says that she's uh, being foiled in her bid to deport people by lefty lawyers, many of them bankrolled by the Labour Party. Well, you know, when, when this, this party's been in power for 13 years, to keep blaming the Labour Party and lefty lawyers for every failure of the government is is really just quite quite pathetic, frankly. I you know, I think they they ought to own this problem. It's 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 clear that they haven't dealt with the issue of uh, asylum seekers. Uh, the fact that we are spending six million pounds a day on housing them when the, the, the application backlog is so huge is, is nothing other than a failure that they should absolutely uh, own themselves. And to blame other people, I'm afraid, is symptomatic of a bankrupt government. The, the other thing the government's announcing today are plans to give police uh, greater powers to investigate lower level crimes, so uh, theft, burglaries, etc. Um, is this something that the Labour Party would welcome? It seems common sense to many. Well, yeah, again, again um, 13 years into a Conservative government, we're now deciding that the police should investigate all crimes. I mean, I, I would have thought that was something that we would have all agreed was something that should have been happening anyway. It just strikes me as, as utterly bizarre that this is now becoming an issue. And I think, again, it's it's showing how much our uh, our public sector has been stripped back over, over the last 13 years and ground into the, gr in, into the ground. 
Uh, the Labour Party today is uh, you wanting to talk about postcode lottery in, in cancer care. Of course, we know that postcode lot lottery does exist for many different health complaints, doesn't it? Why do you think highlighting the fact that people with cancer suffer from this makes a difference? Well, I think it's it's very important that we highlight this because ov obviously uh, cancer is something that if it's not uh, caught early can lead to far worse outcomes, including, of course, death. And, and the government actually scrapped their two-week uh, treatment target only last week. So we think it's a timely uh, opportunity to, to, to actually highlight the fact that many people in parts of the country are not getting that vital treatment at the right time. Well, the government said, you know, they didn't say they scrapped the two-week thing. They just, they just said that they've simply uh, brought a whole load of different regulations together and that it actually will, will make treatment more efficient. And it was something that was certainly brought in with, with cancer charities and also doctors as well. It wasn't, it, it wasn't just the government's idea. Well, it, it always seems to be the way when there's a problem in the NHS, the first reaction from the government is that they decide to uh, change and scrap targets. And look, we know that getting treatment for cancer at the earliest possible opportunity is absolutely vital to get the best outcome. So we think that a, a two-week uh, target is something that really needs to continue to have a focus. Uh, uh, speaking to the media yesterday, Rachel Reeves, the Shadow Chancellor, said that Labour would not increase taxes on, on the most wealthy. Uh, this is the 45p rate of tax, of course, that has been much discussed. Uh, Momentum, who are, are an organisation to the left of the Labour Party, have said that this is absolutely shameful. What does the Labour Party stand for? Well, the Labour Party stands for greater opportunity, equality, uh, investment in public services, uh, supporting our NHS. These are all things that uh, a Labour government would hope to deliver. And, and look, I, I understand why people are concerned about what's being said in recent days, but we have to remind ourselves that we've already got the highest tax burden since the Second World War. We've had 12 to 18 months of absolute chaos from this government where they've been flip-flopping on tax policy. And it's really important that as a hopefully incoming government, we send us a message of stability and certainty out there that actually we're not going to mess around with tax rates other than what we've already said we're going to deal for specific policies. We need to create a sense of uh, stability and calm so that businesses have the confidence to invest so we can get that level of growth that will actually help us deliver some of these policies that we want to see uh, spreading out across the nation. But your critics will say that stability and certainty is something that you can't expect from someone like Keir Starmer because this is a man who promised uh, that he would increase the 45p rate of income tax when he stood for party leadership. Uh, a number of those promises that he made when he stood for party leadership, he's already rode back on. How can the Labour Party say it's a, it's a party of stability if your leader keeps changing his mind on what you stand for? Well, I don't think uh, Keir's principles have changed. What's changed is the economic it's circumstances. Changed. That's the same and as your principles, you look, isn't it? Well, look, if you look, if you look at the... Uh, 10 pledges that he made when he stood for leader, I believe at least eight of those are still uh, still live. You could argue about... So should we just believe 80% uh, of what the Labour Party tell us? Well, look, I think, I think it's important to note that since those pledges were made, we've had a pandemic, we've had a war in Ukraine. Those have had massive impacts on the economy. And then, of course, we've had the shambles of the quasi quartang Liz Trust budget last year, which is still wrecking havoc on the economy now. So... The circumstances have changed, and if, if we stuck to, to exactly the pledges we'd made three years ago, you'd say, well, the world's changed. Why haven't you kept up with it? You would be criticising us for that as well. Well, but because pledges are, are, are what goes to the heart of the party, isn't it? Yes, and as I said, we, we, we've uh, maintained 80% uh, of those, and those that, that have changed are because the economic situation has changed. I think it would, it would be uh, remiss of us not to acknowledge that actually this country has had an awful lot of economic shocks in the last few years. Uh, one of those, at least, was uh, uh, implemented by an out-of-control government, and if we pretend that didn't happen, then you would just be saying we've not, we've not kept up with reality. So um, it, it's, it's, I'm afraid, it's sad, sad that we've had to do this, but it's a reflection of where we are as a country. Um, another uh, subject that there's been a big row about in the last few weeks is, is the ULES expansion zone in London. It, it costs Labour uh, the Uxbridge by-election. Uh, there's now even reports of a pay-per-mile charge coming in for drivers in London. Um, do you think Labour can afford to lose 
votes in London. I mean, there is this donut of seats around central London that are going to be affected by the, the ULEZ congestion expansion. Can Labour really afford to lose those seats over this one issue? Well, look, we're, we're not uh, looking to, to, to lose seats anywhere. We want to maximise our vote, get a good, strong majority so we can deliver on our priorities for the British people. In terms of that pay per mile story, Siddiq Khan's already said that's not going to happen. That's not Labour policy. In terms of ULEZ, we've asked him to think again on that. And look, we've got to remember as well that it was actually the Conservative government that asked him to deal with clean air and air pollution. I think everyone would agree that dealing with air pollution is an important issue. I think it's just that the uh, impact it's had on people in what is a tough time economically is something that has caused us to uh, ask him to think again about it. But if the Conservatives think they're going to win an election on ditching green policies, then I say bring it on, because I think they, they would be drawing entirely the wrong conclusion about what's right for this country and what the priorities of the British people are. You've asked him to think again about it, but he, he's, he's sticking to his guns. This shows a real schism in the Labour Party, doesn't it, between Keir Starmer and, and Sadiq Khan? Well, look, what it shows is that uh, when someone is democratically elected by the people that they uh, uh, they represent, they have the mandate and he is entitled to uh, continue to govern London in the way he sees fit. We're also entitled to say to him, we think he should think again and can reconsider some of his policies when it's having an effect on people. Uh, but we're not going to start imposing on uh, local councils and mayors our view on the way the world works because we actually want to go in the opposite direction. We want to give communities greater power and say over their own futures. We want them to take back control and we've got a bill that will do that when we get into government. Justin Matters, the Shadow Minister for Employment Rights. Good to talk to you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Now, the Spanish Football Federation will hold an urgent meeting today after its president was suspended by FIFA. Luis Rubiales has refused to step down despite calls for him to go after he kissed player Jenny Hermoso at the Women's World Cup final on the lips. An internal investigation is also taking place as the Federation activated its sexual violence protocol. Our correspondent Betty, Becky Cottrell has the latest. It will be interesting to see what happens today, particularly with any developments around that emergency meeting of Spain's Football Federation. The new interim president, Pedro uh, Rojas, will be acutely aware of the pressure around this story and he will want to be seen to get his next move right. The Spanish Football Federation, I think it's fair to say, didn't get things right after that kiss, after the backlash. They came out very much in defence of Luis Rubiales, even threatening Jenny Hermoso with legal action, of course, now Luis Rubiales has been uh, suspended by FIFA and although his presence will still loom large over Spanish football, I think those at the top now will want to take a different approach. There is pressure from the government saying that they do not want to see Luis Rubiales in a position of power in Spanish football ever again. You've got the players, uh, Spain's national women's squad, uh, those players saying that they will not return uh, until Luis Rubiales steps down. Then you've got many members of the public who are not happy about this and we expect there might be some kind of demonstrations today uh, in protest at how this has all been handled and I think therefore you might see kind of three things happening in the next 24 hours the next couple of days you could see Luis Rubiales just saying you know enough's enough okay I'm gonna go the pressure's got too much you could see the Spanish Football Federation uh, after they've had that meeting today kind of calling for Luis Rubiales to resign or sort of taking steps uh, to make that uh, a reality or they could simply say we support the suspension and the investigation that's taking place and we'll wait to see the outcome of that. I think to be honest if the third one was what the Football Federation are to go with that will not be enough to kind of make the media attention around this, the anger around this go away. Becky Cottrell there. The future of dementia care could be changing as researchers begin a new study into smart sock technology to help people living with the disease. The socks monitor the user's temperature, heart rate and signs of distress and it's hoped they could stop injuries before they happen. A West of England correspondent, Dan Whitehead, reports. Hello, Peter. At the Garden House Care Home in Bristol, 89-year-old resident Peter Drew is taking part in scientific research, specifically his new socks. The invention wirelessly transmits data to an app used by care home staff. The information monitors vital stats as well as agitation in those living with dementia. Now on this page, we're seeing activity, so how much Peter's moving around with, uh, with the sock. We also record 
his heart rate. What we're doing with the smart socks is to detect signs of distress that the person might not be able to articulate due to a condition like dementia. Um, it's really important that we detect this early so that the carer can intervene and support that person. So we generate an alert then through our app, the carer can respond to that alert, support the person. For carers at this home, any new way to look after their residents is welcome. It could certainly prevent um, falls um, because it would provide the early warning system for staff to um, it, it give into intervention. Um, it, could, um, it could prevent distress between um, two sets of residents, as well as all the usual signs of infection, pain and other physical things. The Smart Socks invention has just secured new research funding, which is being led by the University of Exeter. For us, it's all about accurately measuring agitation and distress in people with dementia. So that's a real challenge because um, as dementia gets more severe, communication gets more difficult. It's time to do the largest study of these socks in nursing homes. So we're scaling things up. Uh, we're going to be trialling the socks on 30 people uh, living with dementia in uh, three or four nursing homes in the southwest. Ultimately, things like smart socks are intended for use not just in care settings, but inside people's actual homes. They are part of a growing trend in high-tech solutions to help people suffering with complex conditions. We cannot have a carer, a professional carer, in each and every household of people living with, with dementia. Their partners are doing what they can, but they are limited with their capacity, and we need to support them. Technology is the way to support them, is the way to enable better care in the home. This is the latest invention to incorporate technology into the care system. There's a lot of anxiety there as well. Yeah. It allows nurses to have eyes and ears on a patient, even when they're not in the room. Dan Whitehead, Sky News, in Bristol. The singer Florence Welsh has revealed that she has had life-saving emergency surgery after being forced to cancel some gigs. The singer posted on Instagram on Sunday that she didn't really feel strong enough to tell you yet, but it has saved my life. She's reassured fans she'll be back to finish the Dance Fever tour in Lisbon and Malaga, with a little less jumping around, perhaps. Well, our theatre goes in London's West End got more drama than they bargained for over the weekend after police were dispatched to remove members of the audience who were apparently misbehaving. <laughs> There were whoops and cheers after four people were escorted out during the interval at a performance of Greece in the Dominion Theatre. The second half of the show had to be delayed by 20 minutes. Officers dealt with individuals who were described as being rude and abusive. Always polite, though, here uh, is Alex with the sports news. <laughs> yes, plenty of sport coming up. One sportsman is £14 million richer this morning as well. That would be nice, wouldn't it? On a bank oh, holiday Monday. Yeah. <laughs> we'll be telling you all about that in a bit. But first, it was another enthralling day of action in the Premier League while Team GB had a day to remember at the World Athletics Championship. Let's round up the sport for you now. VAR. VAR. Ooh. I just got deja vu. This sports bulletin is brought to you by Vitality Insurance. It was a special day for Team GB at the World Athletics Championship as they finished with a record equaling 10 medals, their best performance in 30 years. Keely Hodgkinson was one of the stars for Team GB, securing silver in the 800 metre final in Budapest. Keely Hodgkinson missed out on the gold medal in a dramatic finish to the race. The 21-year-old had to settle for second place behind the winner, Kenya's Mary Moura. Hodgkinson also won silver at last year's World Championships and the Tokyo Olympics. Britain's other finalist, Gemma Riki, came home in fifth place. More medals followed on the final two track events. Britain's men's 4x400 metres relay team won a bronze. The USA won gold ahead of France. A bronze two for Britain in the women's 4x400 relay, matching their achievements from last year. The Netherlands just pipped Jamaica to the gold medal. 
Liverpool and Newcastle have played out some thrilling encounters over the years. And there was another classic instalment on Sunday. Darwin Nunez came off the bench to help Liverpool come from a goal down with 10 men to win 2-1 at St James's Park. Newcastle went in front in the first half after a mistake by Trent Alexander-Arnold allowed Anthony Gordon to score. And worse was to come for Liverpool three minutes later when captain Virgil van Dijk was sent off for a foul on Alexander Isak, denying the striker a goal-scoring opportunity. Despite being a player down, Liverpool kept Newcastle at bay and with nine minutes to go, substitute Darwin Nunes equalised. And in the third minute of stoppage time, Mo Salah set up Nunes to score the winner for Liverpool. Defending Premier League champions Manchester City made it three wins out of three after beating Sheffield United 2-1. Manchester City had to work hard for their win. Erling Haaland put them in front in the second half. That's after missing a first-half penalty. With five minutes to go, Sheffield United, who'd lost their first two games back in the Premier League, equalised with a goal from Jaden Bogle. But with two minutes to go, City secured the win with a goal from Rodri. The win is manager Pep Guardiola's 200th in the Premier League. Aston Villa made it back-to-back -back wins in the Premier League after beating Burnley 3-1. Burnley are still yet to pick up a point this season. Matty Cash scored twice in the first half to help Aston Villa on their way to victory. Cash hadn't scored in 15 months in the Premier League prior to yesterday's game. In the Championship, Blackburn beat Watford 1-0 to get their first victory at Vicarage Road for 22 years. Brian Hedges scored the only goal of the game. In Germany, England captain Harry Kane scored twice for Bayern Munich on his home debut in a 3-1 win over Augsburg. Kane has now got three goals since joining the club from Tottenham. In golf, Norway's Victor Hovland will be waking up £14 million richer today after he won the Tour Championship and season-ending FedEx Cup in Atlanta. Hovland hit a bogey-free 7-under par 63 to win by five strokes on 27-under par, holding off the challenge of Xander Schofle. This was Hovland's sixth PGA Tour title, but the biggest win of his career. In cricket, Oval Invincibles have won the 100 competition for the first time after they beat the Manchester Originals in the final. Chasing 162 for the win, Manchester Originals finished on 147 as the men's Invincibles celebrated becoming champions by 14 runs. Southern Brave are the women's champions. They beat Northern Superchargers by 24 runs, chasing 140. The Superchargers were all out for 105. Grace Ballinger was the last wicket to fall. She was run out by a throw from Georgia Adams. World champion Max Verstappen has equaled the record of consecutive Formula One race wins after his ninth straight victory at the Dutch Grand Prix. In a rain-interrupted race, Verstappen came home ahead of Fernando Alonso with Pierre Gasly in third. He now leads the World Championship by 138 points. The win matches Sebastian Vettel's record set 10 years ago. That's all your sport for now. We'll have another update in the next hour. Final whistle. I'll give it a go. <laughs> hmm, maybe not. Thanks, Alex. Well, how's the bank holiday shaping up for the weather? Let's have a look. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. It's going to be dry for most people today, a bit warmer, but showery outbreaks will move into the far northwest later and will spread southeast on Tuesday. Mainly fine right now, fog in some places, a scattering of showers near western coasts, and the morning will stay fine for most with any fog lifting. But it will be quite cloudy for many with the odd light shower. Northern and western parts, most at risk of that. Little change this afternoon, but the showers will tend to fade later with more sunshine coming through. Looks like it could be a pleasant evening. The Weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Still to come on Sky News Breakfast, the Home Secretary tells police forces they must investigate all types of crime. What we're actually trying to do here is, is, is combine 
what has worked really, really well in, in professional sports, because that's where the, the technology is coming from, and combining that into industrial shipping. So these are rigid sails. They're up to 40 meters high, so that's really, really tall. It's the same product that you use in, in windmills, so it's that, that composite that we're actually using. But also these, these sails are actually detractable as well, so we can actually move them around, and that makes it unique, and we're trying to get the best of, uh, of both worlds in a way. What we've uh, chosen for in this, uh, in this pilot, because that's basically what it is, is to start with two. Uh, we think we can put that up to three. And with those three, you can get up to savings of 30% of fuel and 30% of carbon emissions. The thing is, uh, supply chains as we know them today are very different as what they were in the days of, of wind, right? I mean, we're just hoping our products to come in time. And, and what we're now doing is trying to combine wind with the normal propulsion, so the normal engine. So we're having the best of the two worlds again. One is the savings on the carbon, but also still have the reliability of these supply chains and, and just-in-time kind of deliveries, which is also very important to uh, reduce emissions. Innovation is, is never without risk, I, I would say, but we went through all the, the, the stages and, and safety, of course, is number one. Uh, that's why you get to class societies who really look at all these things that you're just talking about. Uh, but yeah, there's risk that we're not getting to the savings. There is risk that there is issues when the ship gets to port, uh, but I'm sure that together we will innovate around those and uh, I'm sure that the Windwings 2.0 is going to be even better than this one. We are basically at the moment counting on the same logistics and the same predictability as, as what we've seen before. Uh, we will see during the test and the trials if there's anything uh, different there. But the real concept behind this is that it's really the assisting part. So you're really going for the savings on the fuel and not really altering too much the uh, supply chain of the products that we're shipping. Five of us have made it out of the car. Welcome to Backstage, the film and TV podcast. Good morning, you're watching the Sky News Breakfast. The Home Secretary told us that she's considering a range of options to deal with migrants who cross the channel in small boats and hasn't ruled out using electronic tanks. The Spanish Football Federation called an urgent meeting today over the World Cup kiss as its president refuses calls to step down. And police have launched an investigation into the deaths of two people after they became trapped in a car which drove into floodwater in Merseyside. A little earlier this morning, the Home Secretary told us that police forces in England and Wales must pursue all reasonable lines of inquiry when trying to solve crimes like shoplifting and theft. Forces have been told to use CCTV, doorbell footage and dash cams to help catch offenders and increase conviction rates for so-called low-level offences. Well, earlier, Swella Bravman told me that the government was responsible for recruiting, recruiting an additional 20,000 police officers, a claim which I questioned. We've just recruited 20,000 additional police officers. Well, so we well, now you, have you recruited 3,000 additional police officers. You, you lost 20,000 police officers, didn't you, over uh, from 2010 up to, up to the latest date? So you've lost 20,000, you've gained 23,000. So you've gained 3,000. That's wrong. We now have a record number of police officers. It's, it's ever, the Home Office figures that I have ever, here. ever in the history of policing, far higher than any previous administration. So the police have a the greatest number of police officers they've ever had at their disposal. Okay. We've also got the Home Office figures. It's, you've got 149,000 police officers at the moment. There were 146 in 2010. So absolutely, you have got 3,000 more officers. These are the Home Office figures. Yeah, we've got a record number of police officers ever in the history of policing. So that's the highest number of men and, we men and women working on the front line to stop crime and support victims. 
Let's get to the thoughts of former Dorset Police and Crime Commissioner Martin Underhill. Um, so, more police than ever. Uh, why aren't you doing more to stop catching criminals? To, to catch criminals? Uh, morning, Jane. <clears throat> yes, there are more police officers than ever, and well done for challenging the Home Secretary because um, this government dialogue of we've brought in 23,000 cops, we all know actually it's only 3,000, as you said. Uh, why aren't they catching them? Because in 2016, Theresa May told the police to stop uh, targets, to stop uh, checking on at their performance uh, and to drive vulnerability issues. And so we've seen in the last seven years, policing has completely walked away from the theft of a plant pot, someone's car being stolen. Um, and actually what uh, Brabham has done is a really, really clever political move. We know policing will be one of the top three issues in the next election. And by stating her wishes now, <clears throat> excuse me, she will uh, enable all police crime commissioners to put in their police and crime plan pledges for the next elections because the police crime commissioners are changing at the same time as Parliament next May to bring police forces to account. And you can do it. I did it in uh, 2012 when I stood to be the police crime commissioner for Dorset. I pledged to the people of Dorset that I would double the detection rate. Dorset had the lowest in the country at 15% and it went up to 33%. One in three crimes were solved. And then the Home Secretary told us to stop chasing targets and that all went away. That's why our crime detection rate is so low now because the government told the police to stop chasing figures. So uh, it's rather ironic that we lost the police force numbers through the government that is currently in power. And we also lost the ability to detect crime because of the government currently still in power. Um, but the point about the Dorset story is it can be done, but it took three years. You have to change the investigative model. You have to chase, change the priorities that policing uses to enable them to detect one in three crimes. But it can be done. And indeed, in the 80s and 90s, every police force in this country was solving one in three crimes. But the reason that is, is because they've gone down the vulnerability routes. And my question to the Home Secretary is, yes, you've got roughly the same numbers you had in 2010, but policing has become a lot busier. You've got AI, you've got internet crime, you've got fraud. Fraud is now the biggest crime in this country, and she has made no mention of fraud in her interviews today. Um, and I find that strange because the people who are def defrauded are voters. Uh, so she's prioritising everything except fraud, which I find odd. The, the policing numbers are, 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 you know, slightly more than they were, but of course the population has gone up and, and a lot of people have made the point that of the 20,000 officers that were lost, many of those were lost were, were officers with a great deal of, of experience and that those who have, have come in are, are a lot newer. Do, do you think that the police force has, has been weakened or strengthened under the Conservative Party? Oh, undoubtedly weakened in every way. Um, to pick up your point, a third of all police officers on the front line uh, of the streets of England and Wales today have less than five years service. Um, I didn't consider myself an experienced police officer and I was a uniformed police officer for 10 years until I'd done 10 years. Uh, we lost all the experience during the austerity cuts uh, and it's going to take years to replace that. And don't forget, since then, we've had this huge explosion of internet crime um, and most police forces weren't ready for that and most police officers aren't tech savvy enough to deal with that. Um, and then we've got AI coming, and you've also got the fraud issue. So I welcome today's announcement. I think it's very clever because you will see targets coming back and police forces being held to account by police and crime commissioners after the elections next year. Uh, because at the end of the day, why are the police forces if they don't solve crime? That's actually why they're there. So I think the public will welcome this. It's a great vote winner, but they need more officers. The Home Secretary says that overall crime is going down. Do you think it is? I don't think it is for a minute. I think it's gone online. Um, that's why you don't get the car thefts, the armed robberies that some of us grew up with. Um, it's gone online and people aren't reporting it. That's the truth of the matter. Um, I do not consider in any way that England and Wales is safer now than it was 10 years ago, uh, which is a dialogue that I'm, I'm hearing the government say, and I heard the HMIC say. I don't agree with that. Uh, everybody I speak to is suffering online crime, not physical crime. OK, uh, really interesting to talk to you today. Martin Underhill, uh, former Dorset Police and Crime Commissioner. Thanks a lot for talking to us on Sky. Now, wearable smart socks are being trialled as a way to alert dementia sufferers and their carers 
to possible falls and illnesses. Let's talk a little bit more about this with Samantha Benin Hemens, who is the Executive Director of Policy and Communications at Alzheimer's Research UK. Uh, great to talk to you today. So, so these socks, the, the sufferers uh, put them on and then they transmit this signal. Just, just explain how useful that is. So, as you'll be aware, dementia is a progressive neurological condition and there are lots of symptoms and side effects that come with that. So, many people will experience anxiety and agitation. And so, at the later stages of dementia, it can be very disorientating and people can struggle to um, relax themselves and, and find that calm again. So what's so interesting about this innovation is that it's able to detect changes like um, changes to heart rate and blood pressure that allow um, staff and supporting carers to identify agitation and anxiety at an earlier stage and also monitor other aspects of someone's care. The key thing here is that this is just one of many innovations that we're now seeing in dementia research. We feel that we're at a golden age in terms of innovation in dementia research. We're seeing innovation in new treatments. So, for example, up until now, we've only had symptomatic treatments for Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. And we're now entering an era where there are now disease modifying therapies coming online that actually tackle the underlying challenge of dementia and tackle the underlying disease processes. But these um, smart socks and other wearables are also heralding an innovation in detection and diagnosis. So as we've seen with many other health conditions, the earlier we can detect changes in the body, the more likely we are to be able to treat these conditions and, and hopefully create a world where people can survive these conditions. And I think what's so interesting is the work around these sorts of wearables where they're, they're passive, non-invasive tools that can really help us to detect changes in our bodies at a much earlier stage. And there's a lot of research going on on that at the moment. Mm, I suppose my thought, thought would be, you know, if these socks are, are, are helping communicate stress levels to, to staff, um, I mean, wouldn't it be better if, if these patients were being observed rather than sort of remotely monitored by their socks? Absolutely. We know that people who are um, going into care homes, for example, are at a quite considerable stage of need. And what people really need is personalised care. And I hope that things like this technology allow us to provide that to people. Um, dementia is a very difficult condition. It affects people in many different ways. So um, people can um, feel disorientated. They can struggle to recognise familiar faces. Um, it can um, change the, people's ability to... Um, often people get lost because they, they can't recognise where they are. And so all of that can be really challenging. And in some cases, it leads to a lot of frustration for the person affected. So what we would suggest is that people are provided with um, the right uh, diagnosis, treatment and support at every stage of their dementia. And we need innovation in research to enable us to provide that excellent care for people. Samantha Benham Hermes um, from Alzheimer's Research. Good to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take a quick look at the weather. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Dry for most today and a bit warmer, but showery outbreaks will move into the far northwest later and will spread southeastwards on Tuesday. Uh, mainly fine now, but fog in places and a scattering of showers near western coasts. The morning will stay fine for most, with any fog soon lifting, but it'll be quite cloudy for many with the odd light shower. Northern and western parts are most at risk. There'll be little change this afternoon, but showers will fade later with more sunshine coming through. The weather. Sponsored by Qatar Airways. Hope you can get out there and make the most of it. You're watching Sky News Breakfast. Coming up, we've got this morning's papers. A final look through with the broadcaster and writer Edward Adu and the PR and crisis management expert Kevin Craig. Don't go away.
Play Sky News. From the Sky News Centre at 7. Now that you're up to date, we can go into a bit more detail. Things can change incredibly quickly. Taken by surprise. Have you ever known a moment like this in British politics before? Yes. <laughs> Cheers. We'll start with breaking news. Let's get the latest on the ground. So, by the end, we'll hopefully all understand what's going on in the world just that little better. I'm Inzamam Rashid and I'm Sky's North of England correspondent telling stories from this culturally rich region I call home. Do you know what kind of pollen gets up your nose? <laughs> Sky News Pollen Reports, brought to you by the Kleenex Your Pollen Pal app. The morning will be mostly fine once any early fog lifts, but Lincolnshire, East Anglia and the South East will see cloud and patchy light rain or drizzle taking over. There'll be just the odd light shower elsewhere. It'll be a degree or so warmer than recently. The afternoon will bring little change, but Eastern England will slowly dry up while showers elsewhere will begin to fade. Looking at pollen counts, they will be mostly high in the warmer, mainly dry south and low in much of the north. Sky News Pollen Reports, brought to you by the Kleenex Your Pollen Pal app. Well, let's take a look at the morning papers now. We have the broadcaster and writer Edward Adu and the PR and con crisis consultant management expert Kevin Craig in the studio. Uh, thanks very much, guys, for coming in this morning and morning. being with us. Um, the Daily Mail. Uh, Edward, let's start with you with this one. Uh, this picture of uh, Donald Trump, the £5 million mugshot. Um, it's certainly something that's generated a lot of interest on the internet, loads of memes out there, but it's also generated a lot of funds. Yeah, I mean, to, 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 to be fair, um, no, no one was expecting this. It's happened. And a lot of memes, a lot of people are making comparisons. There's one um, a friend of mine who tweeted to say, when you walk into um, a, a Jamaican takeaway and when you ask the lady behind the counter who's not having a, bad, who's not having a good day, she, 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 will not, she will have that look. And that made me laugh. And to make that comparison... Um, it, it just seems we we are in where we are in terms of, of, of politics connected to to the states, and who would have ever ever envisaged or imagined 
the a former American president to have a, a, a mugshot taken or to be in this predicament. I want to say, Jane, Ed, Eddie's right. It, it, it's unimaginable. And we chose this story from page four of the Mail, talking about how over five million quid has been raised since he did that um, uh, mugshot. But it's extraordinary, right? Just to bring the put context in this story in several papers today. He is literally. This is incontestable. He's literally a convict convicted sex offender because of the, the case uh, recently where he um, uh, 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 had to pay over £5 million pounds of woman to be defamed and he lied about. And he's charged 91 times. And America seems unshockable, you know? Charged with paying off a porn star, charged with stealing state secrets, charged with tr uh, being involved in the coup on, cap on the Capitol, and charged with trying to steal the election in Florida. I mean, in, um, in Georgia. I mean, it's... What, what, am I imagining this? You're not, but, but it seems that every, question, every charge that's added to seems to increase his popularity and, and, and makes his supporters feel oh. more justified. I was going to say, what's happened, what's happened to Melania Trump? No one's heard or, or seen of her. I mean, completely, I'm not saying she's disappeared, <laughs> but that's, that, no, one's answered, no one's asked that question. Yeah. Well, that's the, that's the key question of the, of yeah. the morning, Edward. Thanks for, thanks for raising that. Uh, let's move on to the, to the Daily Mirror. <laughs> um, th this is a, a story, I mean... It, it's I like about the segue, American James. Bullies. American bullies. American Nicely bullies, done. Yeah. yeah. You see what I did there? Yeah. Um, different kind of bully, though. Um, and these are the dogs. A scary uh, bully. The, yeah. I mean, the, the bullies are, can be really lovely, cute, kind dogs, but this particular breed is responsible for 73% of fatal dog attacks in the UK. Jane, I'm not sure whether I, if someone gifted one, uh, said, look, here's a birthday or um, a Christmas present. I'm going to be honest with you, I'm scared of dogs. I was bitten by a Doberman when I was eight years old, and that has um, scared me for life. And a lot of friends have said, Ed, you need to go and see someone. You need some um, some therapy. But clearly, when it comes to these bullies, um, yeah. uh, 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 the statistics related to the, um, the attacks uh, with them that they carried out by them is just shocking. I mean, sadly, a, a 10-year-old um, in Cardiff... Um, as it was killed by one of these dogs. Now, the Mirror are trying to uh, campaign for uh, to try and overhaul the Dangerous Dogs Act, and it, sh it, sh it should be it should be done. And I'm not having a go at people who have these types of dogs, but it seems the majority. It seems like a fashion accessory because a, lo a lot of celebrities, uh, a lot of rappers in the states, seem to have uh, these dogs. Um, I just I just wouldn't go near them. They just, they look menacing. It's really hard, isn't it? We, we got a, one of my, my sons was not, not very comfortable with, with dogs and we got a, a dog, but we went, we were lucky enough to go and meet the dog's mum and the grandmum and the great grandmum. And they were, they had, they weren't bullies, they were retrievers, but we saw the personality of the yeah. family. And that's really important, is to do your research and to make sure that you're getting a dog that has got the right kind of personality and you've got the time and energy to train it and, and love it and, and, and keep it happy. Yeah, and, you know, we are a nation of dog lovers and if you ever say anything which can be deemed remotely negative about dogs, you know, then you stand back and watch your social media explode. But on this, this is low-hanging legislative fruit here. There, there could be a change and this particular breed has got issues around it, which is not to say that the majority of dogs aren't a fantastic addition to our lives. So I hope the Mirrors campaign gets some traction. Yeah. Um, right, we're looking at one of the back pages now, and this is the Daily Express, yes. uh, and this is uh, Keely Hodgkinson uh, doing extraordinarily well, isn't she? Well, I thought this was a, a, a good story for us to pick because, you know, we have just finished last night, achieved our best result, uh, Team GB, in a World Athletics Championships for 30 years. Um, we've got 10 medals. Uh, Keely Hodgkinson is a fantastic triple uh, silver medal uh, winning athlete now at elite level and things are moving in the right direction and after a difficult couple of years for athletics with the administra administrative body in our country I wanted to pick this out and celebrate our athletes uh, and their achievements and hopefully it will encourage more kids to get involved in a fantastic sport. Totally. I mean, maybe a magazine like Vogue could maybe put, put one of those women in their top 25 inspirational yes. women Or one of Eddie's category. shirts, even. Yeah. Yeah. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Nicely done, Kevin. Nicely yeah. done. Um, we've, got, we've got a lovely picture of the Notting Hill Carnival, Edward. Uh, the Petite Caribbean Queens, they're calling them. It was the Children's Day parade yesterday. Edward, have you managed to enjoy <laughs> in, any of it? Have you gone down to any of it? No, you know what? I've... Jane, you're going to say, Ed, you need to stop working. I have yes. been working non-stop. I spoke to... I was on the radio yesterday. We did a live feed from 
Carnival and uh, um, Valley, lovely Valley Fontaine, who was down there for us and was mani managed to, to capture the, the vibe, the sound systems. She tried to get to the Rampage sound system, but she couldn't. But this year in particular of Carnival, Children's Day yesterday, Families, uh, Families Day, uh, it's the celebration of 50 years of the sound systems and mass bands. One thing which Valley mentioned, when I go to Carnival, I love to um, l love to get get a portion of jerk chicken, curry goat, and <laughs> no, rice and peas. we were just talking peas. about chicken last 18... hour. Cut that out. Yeah. I hope you get 18... some vegetables no, with but it. This... No, no, definitely. But eighteen pounds <gasps> for, a, for a portion at Carnival. I mean, come on. I know the stall holders have to make. Uh, they, they've got to recoup. But eight. I think. I think the cheapest was. 12 pounds and a patty, a salt fish chicken patty, four, four or five pounds. I, I, I said to Valley, I said, look, I could go to places in London. I could literally, <laughs> I could buy you and Kevin and the whole team at Sky News a, 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 literally like a, a big bag of we'll, we'll hold you to that. And a rice for like tw oh, <laughs> for 20 quid. <laughs> Not a carnival. Uh, Kevin, Kevin, just a quick call. I mean, segue into that. Yeah. Uh, nine pounds a pint. Well, uh, this is one of the inside of one of the other papers. Yeah, in in the sun. inside the sun. Extraordinary. A real segue uh, there on the on the cost of living and the cost of, of food and drink. And that they um, uh, there's places in London, unsurprisingly, where the price of a pint is top nine quid. I was really interested to see that the cheapest pint in the country, uh, in over uh, fifty thousand places surveyed, still under two quid. And I think that was in Hyde in, in uh, Greater Manchester. So everyone's going to be there next weekend. Fantastic. But, you know, nine quid for a pint. You know, you need a drink to calm down and think about yeah. it. Uh, Kevin and Edward, <laughs> thank you both so much. Great choices this morning. Have thank, you. thank you. You're watching Sky News Breakfast. Stay with us for the next hour where we talk more about the Home Secretary looking at the range of options to deal with migrants.
It's nine o'clock. This is Sky News Breakfast. These are our top stories this morning. The Home Secretary refuses to rule out using electronic tags on those who come to the UK on small boats. Whereas the view from Labour is that its potential use does not deal with the root of the problem. We need to exercise a level of control of people if we're to, to remove them from the United Kingdom. We are considering a range of options. My understanding is that people who are coming to this country seeking asylum are not criminals. They're usually people feeling, fleeing persecution. And the Spanish FA will hold an urgent meeting to discuss the World Cup kiss row with the organisation's suspended president under increasing pressure to resign. Police launch an investigation as two people die after becoming trapped in their car in a flooded road in Liverpool. The future of dementia care and the smart sock technology which could help those living with the disease. And in the sport, Darwin Nunes helped 10-man Liverpool produce a dramatic late comeback as they beat Newcastle 2-1. We'll round up all the Premier League action. Hello, good morning. Thanks for joining us. The government is not ruling out using electronic tagging to control migrants who come to the UK illegally. Earlier, the Home Secretary told me she's considering a range of options in dealing with migrants who cross the channel in small boats. We've just uh, enacted uh, a landmark piece of legislation in the form of our Illegal Migration Act. That empowers uh, us to detain those who arrive here illegally there and thereafter to swiftly remove them to a safe country like but, Rwanda. But will you put tags on them in the, in the, in the meantime? That will require uh, a power to detain and ultimately control those people. We need to exercise a level of control of people if we're to, to remove them from the United Kingdom. We are considering a range of options. We have several thousand uh, or a couple of thousand detention places in our existing removal capacity. Uh, we will be working intensively to increase that. But it's clear we're in, in exploring a range of options, all options, to ensure that we have that level of control over people so that they can flow through our system swiftly to enable us to thereafter remove them from the United Kingdom. We will have to wait until the outcome of our litigation in the Supreme Court relating to Rwanda. And if we are successful, we will be operationalising our policy. If we're thwarted by the courts, if we're stopped from doing so, we'll do whatever it takes to ensure that we can stop the boats. That's a pledge that the Prime Minister has made. That's one that I have made. It's one that we are working both night and day to deliver. It, it isn't working, though, is it? Last week alone, there were 1,773 migrants who crossed the Channel. Uh, do you not think it was a mistake to make such a bold pledge at the start of the year? It's what the British people expect of us. It's what I passionately believe is the right thing working. to do. Uh, and we are making progress. As I said, we've passed our landmark legislation. But let's also be clear about what we're up against. We're up against a range of forces which are intent on stopping us, whether it's immigration lawyers, charities, NGOs, many of whom have very close links with the Labour Party operating night and day to stop us in delivering this pledge through legal challenges in the courts, through administering uh, dodgy legal advice to illegal asylum claimants and illegal migrants, through sometimes facilitating illegal migration through their so-called charitable work. There's a range of forces that we are dealing with. Well, I also spoke to the Shadow Employment Minister, Justin Matters, about the Home Secretary's refusal to rule out the use of electronic tags, and he told me such measures don't deal with the root of the problem. The only people you tag are, are criminals, so um, my understanding is that people who are coming to this country seeking asylum are not criminals. They're usually people feel, fleeing persecution. And if there's a problem with uh, people absconding, this is the first I've heard about it, and clearly the solution to that is actually to get on and process the asylum applications a lot quicker than is happening. I think this is just another gimmick that is not dealing with the root of the problem at all. Well, the, moving on to other news now, and the Spanish Football Federation will hold an urgent meeting today after its president was suspended by FIFA. Luis Rubiales has refused to step down despite calls for him to go after he kissed player Jenny Hermoso at the Women's World Cup final.
and internal investigations also taking place as the Federation activated its sexual violence protocol. Well, let's get more from our correspondent, Becky Cottrell, who is in Madrid for us. Uh, and Becky, are, are we expecting to hear anything today? It certainly feels that something could happen today. There are several things happening that are really going to apply pressure to Rubiales to quit. Firstly, we've got that emergency meeting of uh, the Spanish FA, which was until very recently led by Mr Rubiales, unsurprisingly. After the fallout from that kiss, they came out very strongly defending him, even threatening Jenny Hermoso, the player involved, with legal action for speaking out. I think today you will see a very different approach from them, but will they call for him to resign? We will have to see. We've also got the government, who've been very critical of Mr Rubiales, meeting today with organisations that represent uh, women playing within the sport, including the union that represents Jenny Hermoso. Not only will they be discussing Mr Rubiales, they will be discussing wider concerns around the culture within women's football here. Many of the players have complained not only about Rubiales, but about the head coach, Jorge Bilder. He denies any wrongdoing, but the players have said he's created a toxic atmosphere that has impacted their emotional and physical well-being. Another thing that we're having uh, today, the government does not have the power to remove Mr Rubiales, but they have asked the branch of the courts that deals with sport to meet to discuss initiating proceedings to get rid of him. Will that be necessary? Will Rubiales just send some mute music and go? We'll have to see. We will. Becky, thank you very much. Let's get a look at some of the other stories making the news this morning. Northumbria police have charged two men with the murder of Andy Foster following a suspected ammonia attack in Gateshead. Police believe the 26-year-old was sprayed with a chemical on his doorstep last weekend. He later died. Kenneth Fawcett and John Wanless will appear before magistrates at Newcastle Crown Court later today. Aston Villa's team bus has been attacked after their Premier League match against Burnley. The incident took place at Junction 10 on the M65 motorway following the game at Turf Moor yesterday afternoon. Lancashire police said a brick was thrown at the bus, which struck the windscreen and caused some damage to the vehicle. A small number of people have apparently been injured after a P&O cruise liner was involved in a weather-related incident in Mallorca. The company says that the ship P&O Britannia was carrying thousands of travellers. There is some reports it crashed into a freight vessel during severe storms. Two people have died after becoming trapped in a car which was driven into flood water in Liverpool. Our correspondent, Sadia Chowdhury, uh, is here to tell us more. And, and how, do we know how this happened? Well, Merseyside police are trying to figure out what happened. There's an investigation underway, but what we do know is that two people died. It happened as their car entered floodwaters in Liverpool. They've been formally identified and their families have been um, informed. Now, you can see from these pictures just how much water there was here. Uh, this is on Queen's Drive in Mossley Hill, which is uh, just off the M62 motorway when you're driving into Liverpool. Police say they received a report of concern for the safety of two people, a man and and a woman inside a black Mercedes car. This happened around 9.20 in the evening on Saturday night at a time when visibility would have been poor, even if you're familiar with the area. Now, from a police statement, it appears that there was uh, quite an extensive rescue effort of some sort with lots of people involved. I'll read out to you what Merseyside Police have said. This is from Detective Chief Inspector Mike Dalton, who says... Our thoughts go out to the family of the man and woman who sadly lost their lives in this tragic incident. Despite the best efforts of passing members of the public, our officers and Merseyside Fire and Rescue Services at the, t at the scene. We are at the early stages of an ongoing investigation on Queen Drive, Queen's Drive to establish the circumstances of this tragic incident. And people are being asked to avoid the area uh, and police are appealing for any witnesses or CCTV and dash cam footage. OK, Sadie, thanks very much. The future of dementia care could be changing as researchers begin a new study into smart sock technology to help people living with the disease. They monitor the user's temperature, heart rate and signs of distress and it's hoped it could stop injuries before they happen. Our West of England correspondent Dan Whitehead reports. Hello Peter. At the Garden House Care Home in Bristol, 89-year-old resident Peter Drew is taking part in scientific research, specifically his new socks. The invention wirelessly transmits data to an app used by care home staff. The information monitors vital stats as well as agitation in those living with dementia. On this page, we're seeing activity, so how much Peter's moving around. 
with, uh, with the sock. We also record his heart rate. What we're doing with the smart socks is to detect signs of distress that the person might not be able to articulate due to a condition like dementia. Um, it's really important that we detect this early so that the carer can intervene and support that person. So we generate an alert then through our app. The carer can respond to that alert, support the person. For carers at this home, any new way to look after their residents is welcome. It could certainly prevent um, falls um, because it would provide the early warning system for staff to um, it, it give into intervention. Um, it, could, um, it could prevent distress between um, two sets of residents, as well as all the usual signs of infection, pain and other physical things. The Smart Socks invention has just secured new research funding, which is being led by the University of Exeter. For us, it's all about accurately measuring agitation and distress in people with dementia. So that's a real challenge because um, as dementia gets more severe, communication gets more difficult. It's time to do the largest study of these socks in nursing homes. So we're scaling things up. Uh, we're going to be trialling the socks on 30 people uh, living with dementia in uh, three or four nursing homes in the southwest. Ultimately, things like smart socks are intended for use not just in care settings, but inside people's actual homes. They are part of a growing trend in high-tech solutions to help people suffering with complex conditions. We cannot have a carer, a professional carer, in each and every household of people living with dementia. Their partners are doing what they can, but they are limited with their capacity, and we need to support them. Technology is the way to support them, is the way to enable better care in the home. This is the latest invention to incorporate technology into the care system. There's a lot of anxiety there as well. Yeah. It allows nurses to have eyes and ears on a patient, even when they're not in the room. Dan Whitehead, Sky News, in Bristol. Now, the Fire Brigades Union has launched a legal challenge against the government's plans to house asylum seekers in the Bibby Stockholm barge. It sent a pre-action protocol letter to the Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, claiming that the fire risks posed by the accommodation constitute a callous disregard for the occupants and the safety of firefighters. Well, joining me now from Durham is Matt Rapp, the General Secretary of the Fire Brigades Union. Uh, morning, uh, Matt. What is in this letter? Why have you sent it? Good morning. Well, we're partly exploring what the facts are in the case. Um, we, we've raised a number of questions with, uh, first of all, the local fire and rescue service and now with the uh, Home Office, and we have not had uh, adequate answers to those. I think people will understand why we would be concerned about an unusual use of a barge, uh, and that's perfectly legitimate for us to raise. And unfortunately, the Home Secretary has not adequately answered our questions. Uh, and therefore, we've started the preliminary process of, of legal action on the issue. So you've, tr you've tried to meet her to talk about your concerns. What response have you had? Uh, they've declined to meet us, uh, which again is unfortunate. They meet us on other issues. They've declined to meet us uh, on this. I'd say to, to viewers at this point that, uh, for example, uh, our union warned as long ago as 1991 about the use of flammable cladding systems on buildings. Those warnings were also ignored by governments of different colours, uh, resulting in the Grenfell Tower fire. So we've got a lot of experience in taking up issues of fire safety uh, and regrettably being proved right. Uh, while those in authority have turned a blind eye to risk. Uh, I hope that the Home Secretary won't do that in this case, but we will, uh, if necessary, pursue that issue through the courts. So this pre-action protocol letter that you're sending, uh, my understanding is that she has to, to respond within a set number of days, is that right? Yes, that's uh, later this week. Um, we've given limited time because things seem to be moving quickly. The, the, the sad fact is we're not in full possession of all the facts. We've asked a number of questions. We are aware that from the local fire and rescue service, some concerns were, rest, were, were raised um, some weeks ago. Uh, and again, we're not convinced that those questions raised by the relevant uh, legal authority have adequately been addressed by the people running the barge or by the Home Office. So, from my understanding, when we, when we, sp we spoke to... I spoke to the local uh, Fire Brigade Union uh, a couple of weeks ago on this, uh, th their concerns were largely about the number of people 
on, on board that it, they felt that it was safe for a much smaller number and, and, and access, for example, if there was a fire. I mean, what sort of steps do you think would need to be taken for, in your mind, this vessel to be safe for people to live on? Well, some of these are quite technical questions of, of fire safety risk assessment. So, uh, but clearly people will understand that what you need is um, not to overcrowd the premises, so not to overcrowd the barge and to make sure you've got adequate fire escape routes and fire exits. And I think we understand from press reports that on one visit by journalists, at least one of the fire exits had been closed because the ramp on the other side of it wasn't adequate. Uh, so I think everyone needs to be confident of all those measures being in place before um, before any such premises is put into use. And those are the questions that we've asked in some detail and to which we haven't had an answer. I mean, in, in theory, if it was things like having to widen doorways within, within a vessel, um, I mean, are these the sort of things that could be done relatively quickly? Well, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm not... I've not visited the premises. I've not read the uh, the answers because we haven't had those answers. So I'm not, I'm not prepared to give that answer yet. What we're saying is it's a perfectly reasonable set of questions to ask for ourselves uh, and for the people who would be put on the, on the barge, but for firefighters responding to any fire. Um, and we want those answers before the barge uh, is put into use. OK, Matt Rack, General Secretary of the Fire Brigades Union, thanks for talking to us this morning. Thanks very much. Well, let's uh, talk to our political correspondent, Amanda Acas, who uh, joins me now. Uh, Amanda, this is uh, more pressure on the Home Secretary, isn't it? The Fire Brigades Union now uh, demanding answers about what's actually going on on, on the baby Stockholm. Yes, indeed. It's been a summer of very negative headlines for the Home Office on their handling of immigration policy more broadly. We've seen more and more people arriving um, on small boats crossing the channel. The total number of figures now topping 19,000. And then, of course, the discovery of Legionella on the Bibby Stockholm, which for the government really was quite a flagship policy, both in terms of deterring migrants from trying to make that crossing and, they argue, trying to save the taxpayer money rather than spending uh, so much on putting people up in hotels. Now, as we been hearing from the FBU. They're taking legal action against the government. Uh, Matt Rack explaining there that they have many unanswered questions about their concerns about safety on board the Bibby Stockholm. Indeed, they previously described it as a callous disregard for the safety of firefighters and those on board. Still very unclear how long it's going to be before the migrants will be moved back onto the barge. And really, it's just one of many problems the government are facing over immigration policy. So earlier we heard from Suella Braverman um, celebrating the fact that just before recent the government did successfully pass their Illegal Migration Act, which will give her the legal duty to detain uh, migrants who come here illegally and then deport them to uh, either back home or a safe third country. Of course, the issue is there it still isn't anywhere um, really for them to go. The Rwanda policy is stalled in the courts. And also questions about where those people will be detained, given the lack of accommodation. Um, and the Home Secretary earlier refusing to rule out the possibility of electronically ta uh, tagging um, asylum seekers here in order to keep track of them. Amanda, thanks very much. Let's get a look at the bank holiday weather. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. It will be dry for most today and a bit warmer, but showery outbreaks are moving into the far northwest later and will spread southeastwards on Tuesday. Mainly fine now, but fog in places and a scattering of showers near western coasts. The morning will stay fine for most, with any fog soon lifting, but it will be quite cloudy for many of us with the odd light shower. Northern and western parts are most at risk. Little change this afternoon, but showers will tend to fade later with more sunshine coming through. The far northwest will see the wind picking up ahead of rain this evening. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. The singer Florence Welsh has revealed that she's had life saving emergency surgery after being forced to cancel a number of gigs. Singer posted it on Instagram on Sunday, adding, I don't really feel strong enough to tell you yet, but it saved my life. She reassured fans she will be back 
to end the dance fever tour in Lisbon and Malaga with a little less jumping around. And theatre goers in London's West End got more drama than they bargained for over the weekend after police were dispatched to remove members of the audience. <laughs> there were whoops and cheers after four people were escorted out during the interval. At a performance of Grease at the Dominion Theatre, the second half of the show had to be delayed by 20 minutes. As officers dealt with individuals, they were described by one person there as being rude and abusive. Neither of those things is Alex, who's here with the sport. Yeah, Alex. and I've spent the last hour wondering what I'd do with £14 million prize money that Victor Hovland won yesterday. What would you do with £14 million? Oh, well, uh, I wouldn't be here, that's brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be out the door. Right, <laughs> lots of sport to come. Team GB enjoyed their best performance at the World Athletics Championship in 30 years. We'll round up the final day action. Plus, the world champion Max Verstappen has equaled the record of consecutive Formula One race wins. We'll show you how he won the Dutch Grand Prix. And Harry Kane is enjoying life in Germany. He scored twice for Bayern Munich on his home debut. They beat Wolfsburg 3-1. What we're actually trying to do here is, is, is combine what has worked really, really well in, in professional sports, because that's where the, the technology is coming from, and combining that into industrial shipping. So these are rigid sails. They're up to 40 meters high, so that's really, really tall. It's the same product that you use in, in windmills, so it's that, that composite that we're actually using. But also these, these sails are actually detractable as well, so we can actually move them around, and that makes it unique, and we're trying to get the best of, uh, of both worlds in a way. What we've uh, chosen for in this, uh, in this pilot, because that's basically what it is, is to start with two. Uh, we think we can put that up to three. And with those three, you can get up to savings of 30% of fuel and 30% of carbon emissions. But the thing is, uh, supply chains as we know them today are very different as what they were in the days of, of wind, right? When we're just hoping our products to come in time. And, and what we're now doing is trying to combine wind with the normal propulsion, so the normal engine. So we're having the best of the two worlds again. One is the savings on the carbon, but also still have the reliability of these supply chains and, and just-in-time kind of deliveries, which is also very important to uh, reduce emissions. Innovation is, is never without risk, I, I would say, but we went through all the, the, the stages and, and safety, of course, is number one. Uh, that's why you get to class societies who really look at all these things that you're just talking about. Uh, but yeah, there's risk that we're not getting to the savings. There is risk that there is issues when the ship gets to port. Uh, but I'm sure that together we will innovate around those. And uh, I'm sure that the Windwings 2.0 is going to be even better than this one. We are basically at the moment counting on the same logistics and the same predictability as, as what we've seen before. Uh, we will see during the test and the trials if there's anything uh, different there. But the real concept behind this is that it's really the assisting part. So you're really going for the savings on the fuel and not really altering too much the uh, supply chain of the products that we're shipping. It was another enthralling day of action in the Premier League while Team GB had a day to remember at the World Athletics Championship. Let's round up the sport for you now. That's not how you spell scrumptious. Mmm, scrumptious.
It was a special day for Team GB at the World Athletics Championship as they finished with a record equaling 10 medals, their best performance in 30 years. Keely Hodgkinson was one of the stars for Team GB, securing silver in the 800 metre final in Budapest. Hodgkinson missed out on the gold medal in a dramatic finish to the race. The 21-year-old had to settle for second place behind the winner, Kenya's Mary Mora. Hodgkinson also won silver at last year's World Championships and the Tokyo Olympics. Britain's other finalist, Gemma Riki, came home in fifth place. More medals followed on the final two track events. Britain's men's 4x400 metres relay team won a bronze and the USA won gold ahead of France. A bronze two for Britain in the women's 4x400 relay, matching their achievements from last year. The Netherlands just pipped Jamaica to the gold medal. Liverpool and Newcastle have played out some thrilling encounters over the years and there was another classic instalment on Sunday. Darwin Nunez came off the bench to help Liverpool come from a goal down with 10 men to win 2-1 at St James's Park. Newcastle went in front in the first half after a mistake by Trent Alexander-Arnold allowed Anthony Gordon to score. Worse was to come for Liverpool three minutes later when captain Virgil van Dijk was sent off for a foul on Alexander Isak, denying the striker a goal-scoring opportunity. Despite being a player down, Liverpool kept Newcastle at bay and with nine minutes to go, substitute Darwin Nunez equalised. And in the third minute of stoppage time, Mo Salah set up Nunez to score the winner for Liverpool. Defending Premier League champions Manchester City made it three wins out of three after beating Sheffield United 2-1. Manchester City had to work hard for their win. Erling Haaland put them in front in the second half. That's after missing a first half penalty. With five minutes to go, Sheffield United, who'd lost their first two games back in the Premier League, equalised with a goal from Jaden Bogle. But with two minutes to go, City secured the win with a goal from Rodri. The win is manager Pep Guardiola's 200th in the Premier League. Aston Villa made it back-to-back -back wins in the Premier League after beating Burnley 3-1. Burnley are still yet to pick up a point this season. Matty Cash scored twice in the first half to help Aston Villa on their way to victory. Cash hadn't scored in 15 months in the Premier League prior to yesterday's game. In the Scottish Premiership, newly promoted Dundee got their first win of the season. They beat Hearts 1-0. Luke McCowan scored the only goal. Elsewhere, Aberdeen and St Mirren drew 2-2. In the Championship, Blackburn beat Watford 1-0 to get their first victory at Vicarage Road for 22 years. Brian Hedges scored the only goal of the game. In Germany, England captain Harry Kane scored twice for Bayern Munich on his home debut in a 3-1 win over Augsburg. Kane has now got three goals since joining the club from Tottenham. In golf, Norway's Victor Hovland will be waking up £14 million richer today after he won the Tour Championship and season-ending FedEx Cup in Atlanta. Hovland hit a bogey-free 7-under par 63 to win by five strokes on 27-under par, holding off the challenge of Xander Schofle. This was Hovland's sixth PGA Tour title, but the biggest win of his career. In cricket, Oval Invincibles have won the 100 competition for the first time after they beat the Manchester Originals in the final. Chasing 162 for the win, Manchester Originals finished on 147 as the men's Invincibles celebrated becoming champions by 14 runs. Southern Brave are the women's champions. They beat Northern Superchargers by 24 runs. Chasing 140, the Superchargers were all out for 105. Grace Ballinger was the last wicket to fall. She was run out by a throw from Georgia Adams. World champion Max Verstappen has equaled the record of consecutive Formula One race wins after his ninth straight victory at the Dutch Grand Prix. In a rain-interrupted race, Verstappen came home ahead of Fernando Alonso with Pierre Gasly in third. He now leads the World Championship by 138 points. The win matches Sebastian Vettel's record set 10 years ago. That's all for your sport for now. A reminder that the US Open from Flushing Meadows starts today, live from 3 o'clock on Sky Sports. Novak Djokovic and last year's champion Iga Schwantek are both in action. Full time? Never.
There's always room for a biscuit. Thanks, Alex. Coming up on Sky News Breakfast, we're going to talk to the Vice Chair of the Metropolitan Police Foundation following the Home Secretary's call for police forces to crack down on low-level crime. Good morning. You're watching Sky News Breakfast. These are our headlines this morning. The Home Secretary has told us that she's considering a range of options to deal with migrants who cross the channel in small boats. The Spanish Football Federation has called an urgent meeting today over the World Cup kiss as its president refuses calls to step down. And police have launched an investigation into the deaths of two people after they became trapped in a car which drove into flood water in Merseyside. Now, the Home Secretary has told police forces they must pursue all reasonable lines of inquiry when trying to solve crimes like shoplifting, criminal damage and theft. Well, earlier, Swella Bravman told me that the government was responsible for recruiting an additional 20,000 police officers, a claim which I questioned. We've just recruited 20,000 additional police officers. Well, so we well, now you, have you recruited 3,000 additional police officers. You, you lost 20,000 police officers, didn't you, over, uh, from 2010 up to, up to the latest date. So you've lost 20,000, you've gained 23,000. So you've gained 3,000. That's wrong. We now have a record number of police officers. It's, it's ever, the Home Office figures that I have Ever, here. ever in the history of policing, far higher than any previous administration. So the police have a the greatest number of police officers they've ever had at their disposal. Okay. We've also got home office figures. Is that you've got 149,000 police officers at the moment. There were 146 in 2010. So absolutely, you have got 3,000 more officers. These are the home office figures. 
yeah, we've got a record number of police officers ever in the history of policing. So that's the highest number of men and, week, men and women working on the front line to stop crime and support victims. Well, let's talk to Rick Pry, the vice chair of the Metropolitan Police Federation, who joins me now. Uh, do you welcome this, the fact that the Home Secretary is, is suggesting to police that uh, they should now be pursuing all reasonable lines of inquiry? Yes, I think, broadly speaking, um, we in the Federation and um, the officers and, uh, we represent um, will be broadly supportive of the, um, the uh, proposed changes to the guidance uh, that uh, um, have been outlined this morning. A lot of people will look at this and say, well, hang on, why haven't the police been doing this anyway? It seems using CCTV, dash cam footage, phones and smart doorbells, that seems eminently common sense. Why have the police not been doing that? I think they, the police have been doing that. It's just um, in terms of the guidance that's being suggested, I think a degree of discretion um, has been allowed previously for police managers and leaders to... Um, and prioritise um, certain um, areas of policing. And I think that's probably more the case um, than, um, than is, is, is being laid out at the moment. So if you're going to start reprioritising to look at these crimes, many of them are seen as being more minor crimes, but I mean, obviously, still really distressing for those who, who are involved in them. That's going to then mean that other things are not necessarily investigated. Where do you see that the, the holes forming, as it were. What, what, what will have to go in order for the police forces that we have, who aren't getting any more numbers, who aren't getting any more money, to, to focus their attentions on these kind of crimes? Well, I can only comment on the Metropolitan Police, um, because they're the officers that I, I represent. Um, however, uh, and I'd also agree with your take that um, the use of the word minor is probably unhelpful, because for any victims of crime, um, nothing feels minor, um, irrespective of... Uh, uh, what, what crime has been committed against you. Um, in answer to your second uh, question, I think um, what will happen um, is a reprioritisation towards frontline policing. And uh, I know the Commissioner has already alluded to, um, to that um, in terms of moving resources or um, certainly prioritising the frontline aspects of the uh, Metropolitan Police operation. The, the other thing that the Home Secretary said that she, she really wants is more officers out in the beat to be much more visible. Is, is that realistic? I mean, do, do you have enough officers to get out there on the beat more? Well, I think it's, um, you know, robbing Peter to pay Paul in some respect. Um, but obviously, um, to deal with these type of um, offences that uh, the Home Secretary has alluded to, um, it will require um, moving um, the resources around and prioritising um, um, these areas, um, which will obviously, given that we are a finite resource, will will leave um, other areas of the um, operation um, um, to um, to either look at how they um, do their business or uh, um, you know request a uh, increase in the establishment, which uh, we already know uh, uh, probably won't be forthcoming. Now, of course, we also saw over the weekend this announcement that there had been a leak of data uh, from the Metropolitan Police, which included the personal information of a lot of police officers. Uh, it comes, of course, after the, the, a similar thing happened in Northern Ireland. How concerned are you ab about your members in, in terms of this information that could be out there? We are very concerned um, about this um, data leak that um, has um, occurred. We're, we're not aware of the scale of the leak as of yet. Um, uh, we don't know whether whether or not any information at all has actually been leaked into the public domain. However, the um, the concern is very real, and I've had an awful lot of officers um, contact me um, over the weekend expressing their concern. One of which um, actually phoned me up because he couldn't sleep; he was so concerned um, about his um, identity being uh, compromised um, in this way. So we're treating it very seriously, and we are very worried um, about the possible um, implications of it. OK, Rick Pryor, uh, the Vice Chair of the Metropolitan Police Federation, thanks for joining us this morning. Thank you very much. And there's a warning that more than £174 million a month is potentially being loaned to people experiencing problems with gambling. That's according to the credit platform Abound, who are calling for the use of new technologies to tackle the problem. Well, joining me now is Director of Strategy at Gambling With Lives, Will Prochaska. Uh, Will, good to talk to you, to you today. Um, 
in terms of, of what this research shows, is it, is it perhaps a surprise that those who do gamble are, are borrowing money in order to feed their gambling habit? Um, I'm not actually surprised by the story today at all, um, although it's shocking to see the scale of the numbers uh, laid out so starkly. £174 million a month is an awful lot of money, but we've known for some time there have been lots of evidence that uh, many people gamble more than they can afford to lose. The gambling industry's business model is actually based on taking money from people that can't be afford to be lost. Um, so the, the principle of the story doesn't shock me, but I think it does lay out plainly the scale of the issue and it and I hope it, it it focuses minds at the gambling commission and at the government to try and uh, get ahead of this issue because if you think about it if you, if you think about 174 million pounds a month the human stories behind that will be quite frightening so there's a families up and down the country that can't afford for that money to be taken out of their household bills each each month to be spent on gambling um, and some of the human stories are really shocking and very tragic uh, and they all stem from a mental health condition and at gambling lives we see people who have died uh, we support the families of people who have died, um, and uh, many of them have been gambling on credit before their death. So this is a very serious issue, and, and I hope the story focuses minds. And of course, you say you know this money is coming out of family family budgets, but I mean, if it's coming out of loans, it's 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 even worse than that. It's coming out of future debt, isn't it? So it's it's money that the families don't have in in their budgets, really. Um, I think a lot of people would look at this and say, well, the loan companies, they're not, they're not gambling, they're, they're not involved in the gambling industry. There is a limit to how much information they can get from people when they're trying to loan them money. I suppose in terms of, of data protection, etc., it's not up to the people lending the money, is it, to decide how we spend it when they lend it to us? No, it's not up to the people who lend the money, and certainly I wouldn't blame the credit agencies and the credit providers off the back of this story. Um, actually, the gambling industry knows an awful lot about its customers already and knows full well that it's taking money off of people who can't afford to lose it. What I think this story shows, which is really important, is actually how easy it is for credit agencies to be able to provide more information about their customers' finances in a frictionless way, which doesn't cause cause any issue for the customers at the point of understanding. Now, the gambling industry have been resisting affordability checks for some years, and they resist affordability checks on their customers on the basis that their customers may need to show things like pay slips to be able to prove that they can afford to gamble. Now, what this, this story shows is that actually credit agencies are able to see whether customers can afford to gamble without having to ask them for things like pay slips. And it's done through AI and it's done through things like open banking. So if as a society we're content with that uh, sharing of information when you're offering credit, I think we should also be content with that chain of information before you're allowed to gamble more than you can afford to lose. Um, so I think this really gives a lot of strength to the argument that affordability checks should be should be put in place on the gambling industry to stop them from taking money from people who can't afford to lose it. And there is a raft of help out there, isn't there, if you are struggling with, with gambling addiction. And, uh, you know, a lot of people find it something they're really shamed about and that they can't come forward and seek help. But what, what should people do if, they, if they've realised that this has gone out of control? Well, people should understand that they're not alone. There are up to 1.4 million people in the UK who are suffering from a gambling addiction, um, which is a very significant number of people. So this is actually very common and it's caused by things like very addictive products and very predatory practices of the gambling industry. So they must understand that it's not their fault if they fall into trouble when they try these products. These products are addictive and they're designed to keep you gambling. So that's the first thing that they need to understand. And then they need to know that there is really serious help out there. So the NHS is, is about to open its 15th clinics. There are now going to be 15 specialist gambling cl uh, clinics up and down the country that are there to help you if you're suffering from this mental health disorder. And there's an awful lot of support out there for your loved ones as well. So if you're trying to support somebody who is experiencing um, a, a gambling disorder, there is support for you too. And the first point of that is really to understand what's happening, to understand it is not their fault. It is the fault of the industry that is pushing really addictive products. Will Prochaska from Gambling With Lives, good to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go look at the bank holiday weather. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Dry for most of us today and a bit warmer, but showery outbreaks will move into the far northwest later on and will spread southeastwards on Tuesday. Mainly fine now, but there's fog in places and a scattering of showers near western coasts. The morning will stay fine for most, but any fog soon lifting, but it'll be quite cloudy for many with the odd light shower northern and western parts are most at risk.
Little change this afternoon, but showers will tend to fade later with more sunshine coming through. The far northwest will see the wind picking up ahead of rain this evening. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. It's not exactly balmy August bank holiday weather, is it? Uh, and also less than balmy on the Isle of Wight over the last couple of days. A dramatic weather phenomenon has been captured on camera. It's a towering water spout. Uh, it was spotted just off the coast of the island, an occurrence which the Met Office says is really rare in the UK. Similar to a tornado, and it forms when rotating funnels of air and water mist become tangled in a strong gust. Pretty spectacular to see. Meanwhile, competitors in Wales have once again donned their snorkels and flippers for the return of the World Bog Snorkeling Championships. This is an annual event where competitors try to complete two consecutive lengths of 60 yards of water-filled trenches in the shortest time possible. Uh, in fancy dress, many of them. The championship has taken place over the August Bank holiday since its inception back in 1985. I'm very British. Uh, this is Sky News Breakfast. Uh, coming up, I'm going to talk to an inspirational man at the centre of a new documentary. Play Sky News. From the Sky News Centre at 7. Now that you're up to date, we can go into a bit more detail. Things can change incredibly quickly. Taken by surprise. Have you ever known a moment like this in British politics before? Yes. <laughs> Cheers. We'll start with breaking news. Let's get the latest on the ground. So, by the end, we'll hopefully all understand what's going on in the world just that little better. I'm Inzamam Rashid and I'm Sky's North of England correspondent telling stories from this culturally rich region I call home. What kind of pollen gets up your nose? <laughs> Sky News Pollen Reports. Brought to you by the Kleenex Your Pollen Pal app. 
Now, the morning will be mostly fine once any early fog lifts, but Lincolnshire, East Anglia and the southeast will see cloud and patchy light rain or drizzle taking over. There'll be just the odd light shower elsewhere. It's also going to be a degree or so warmer than it has been recently. The afternoon will bring little change, but eastern England will slowly dry up, while showers elsewhere will begin to fade. Uh, looking at pollen counts, they're going to be mostly high in the warmer, mainly dry south and low for much of the north. Sky News Pollen Reports, brought to you by the Kleenex Your Pollen Pal app. Now, an extraordinary person with an extraordinary tale. Not a horror story is a new film which follows Otto Baxter, a 35-year-old man with Down syndrome, over six years of his life. Let's take a quick look. I have been on TV more times than I can count. Hello, come in, come in. I'm a bit outgoing. Mm. I'm a bit really funny. Mm. I do get very cheeky sometimes. Have a dance, my darling. Well, joining me now is the star of the show, Otto, and also Peter Beard and Bruce Fletcher, the directors of mm. Not a Horror Story. Um, and Otto, it, there, are, it's, there are two films at once, aren't there? There's this documentary about you, but there's also your film at the heart of it, The Puppet Asylum. Um, tell me a little about, bit about that. Why did you want to make this film? Um, I want to make this film because. I just love horror and Christmas. <laughs> and it's a combination of both. Yes, it's, a, it's with both and a bit of... It's a half comedy and musical. So all things that you don't necessarily find together, linking all together with horror and Christmas. Um, why? How challenging was it for you, Otto, given that you have Down syndrome, getting people to engage, people to support you, people to help you make this film? They needed to support me because I got Down syndrome. I've been adopted by Lucy and I got three brothers. And hopefully in the future, I'd like to be in my own Christmas movie. <laughs> well, you've already been in quite a few movies, haven't you? Bruce and Peter are here who have made the second film, which is the documentary about the making of, of Otto's film. Um, uh, Bruce, first of all, how, how, how we, why were you involved? Mm. Uh, well, we met Otto uh, in 2009, actually, when we were making another documentary for the BBC uh, about Otto over his 21st birthday year. It's kind of a, a coming-of-age film. And we uh, became friends uh, and, and just started hanging out from that point. And one thing that Pete and I always noticed was that Otto talked about his life using the grammar of film. He's really obsessed with all sorts of films, musicals, horrors, all of that sort of stuff. So it felt very natural to sort of ask Otto to try and write and direct a film about his life uh, uh, and, and use that as a way of sort of telling his uh, story. So, yeah, that's, that's how the idea came about. And, and also, you, you know, as, as Bruce said, you, you've acted in a, in a few films. Um, you've been the star of various programmes. But w how different was it for you actually being behind the camera? Um, it's actually quite fun to be in front of the camera and behind the cameras. What do you prefer? Um, I like them both. This means I like to be in front of the camera, performing, and behind the camera, lots of bloopers and outtakes. <laughs> <laughs> also, he's very good at working with actors on <laughs> set as a director, cos I think he understands <laughs> that process, don't you? So you were, you were brilliant do, working yes. with the actors <laughs> on your... Well, it's, it's good to have, be, be, to have been on both sides. And, and Peter, the, the fact that you're making this documentary alongside Otto's film, how unusual is that? Cos, I mean, I, I guess in this day and age, because of social media, mm. there is often a lot of other crews there when you're making a film anyway. Yeah. So, I mean, it's really different. I think it was, it was quite odd for Bruce and I, who are normally directors, to be filmed in the behind-the-scenes mm. stuff. That felt quite weird. But, um, I mean, for us, it's... Uh, Otto mm. directing his film was his chance to really tell his story how he wanted to. And us making a documentary about the process was just to get an insight into how his mind worked, I suppose, in a slightly different way. 
we, as Bruce had said, we'd uh, we'd made a film where we just followed him before in a very traditional way. You one way, like you made me make a sandwich. You done for me. So what I'll say, what I'll say, mainly liked was telling everyone what to do all the time. <laughs> finally, <laughs> finally being in charge of everyone. Yes, I'd like to be in charge I'm in the future. I'm getting a sense of that. Also. <laughs> it's a good job you're not trying to be a news presenter, otherwise I'd be out of a job. Um, <laughs> Bruce, in terms of the documentary and the film, I mean, do they have to be watched together or do they work independently? Well, uh, I mean, I think they're best if they're watched together. Uh, we're doing um, a, a cinema release for the film and I think most cinemas are showing them as a, a kind of double bill where you'd watch the documentary and then you'd see Otto's brilliant film after that. So I think they really work as companion pieces, yeah. And, and talk us through, uh, you know, where, where, where and when you can start viewing it from. Uh, so it's, it's uh, the first screening is going to be at Cineworld in Leicester Square today, if anyone wants to come down for that. Um, and then it's going to be on general release uh, from Friday, uh, playing all over the country, Cardiff, Oxford, yeah. Lewis, Manchester, mm. Derby, Leicester, all of those yeah. places. And then it's going to be on Sky from the 23rd of And it's going to uh, be on at September. the Castle Garden. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Castle in the Garden, both in London. Garden. Yeah. yeah. So well. have you got a red carpet for, for today? Yes, we do, yes. It's part of Fright Fest, the horror festival. Yeah. It'll be very exciting. I'll tell you straight after this, he's got to go and have his makeup done. Oh, fantastic. You're actually really going for it on he's, the red he's carpet. Going, I yeah. am. You're going I'm the Costa king Rica. of horror. <laughs> I love it. And what's next for you after this? So you've 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 been on now on both sides, Otto. What do you think? Where do you think your future goes after this? Um, my future hold would be in my own mansion. <laughs> 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 I can host like this show you're doing right now. <laughs> okay. Uh, my own uh, game show. My I'm a bit of a storyteller. Well, well, you're young, so you know you've yeah. got the rest of your life ahead of you. Night so, uh, is young. Thank, mm. thank goodness. Mm. <laughs> Plans, yeah. Well, really lovely to meet you, Otto, Otto Baxter, and also Bruce Fletcher and, mm. and Peter Beard. Thanks a lot, guys, for coming in and talking about both the films. Thank you. Well, that is just about it from Sky News Breakfast, uh, but lots more to come. Do stay with us. Kimberly Leonard is coming up here next. She'll have a lot more on the Home Secretary's comments that the government's considering a range of options in dealing with those who come to the UK on small boats, including tagging.